All right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of Tuesday Night Live on Ten Horse Money YouTube channel. And on the other end, we got Jake Lawrence. We were just talking about Christmas and holiday, and we're talking about this cold, cold weather that's coming. I got. It's funny. You you said Thursday, and Thursday is my day off. So yeah, it's like fifty on Thursday though. I'm planning on getting up as early as I can possibly get up and staying as late as I can possibly stay because I know it's going to be probably like the, the last, last time one, for like yeah. two weeks at least. Yep, at least two weeks, yep. Yeah, and uh, I do not – man, when it gets – 30 is kind of my cutoff. You know, I, I try to I, – I'll fish all winter long, but it, it's like when the ice – when my guides start freezing really bad on, on my yeah. rod, it starts becoming a pain in the butt. Yeah, that, that's, that's where I kind of like I don't I don't know, man. I, yeah, I tell you, I, you know, again, I, I fish a, a, a ton of days during you know spring, summer, and fall, and it's really cool, kind of how I have my like mental kind of how the, the the whole setup works when uh, I'm kind of the kind of guy like I'm 110 percent into whatever it is that I'm doing, and and so I'm all fishing until about generally until about November 15th, and then I take about a two and a half month break and literally almost never think about it. Unless I'm asked a question or, you know, some old story, whatever the case may be. Like I really don't think about fishing that much. It kind of gives me that mental break and uh, time to reflect and, and kind of get away from it. Like that's one thing I, um, again, super fortunate, but spending so much time doing it, you can kind of take it for granted and kind of lose that, um, you know, mental fortitude to kind of stay after it and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's been fun um, kind of getting that. And it's it's unfortunate that this year, kind of right during my hi hiatus uh, of fishing was really when the best uh, bass fishing of the year was going on. December, was super warm, no wind. Everybody was crushing them. But I just, I knew better than to go because I knew once I started, I wouldn't quit. You know, I, I need to need to take a little break. and, and uh, But yeah, I think we're in it for the long haul here for a few weeks. We're going to have to find something to do. I think it's good to step up step back from things i mean i i fish all year long but i don't fish like you do you know like when you're when it when it's on or when you're in it you're in it you're going non-stop for right. months and months and months you know i'm right right, right. i'm like yeah. once, once a week you know, maybe twice a week absolutely and i you know there's so much that goes into it uh outside you know off of the water kind of outside of what what most people see you know the phone calls and the text and and uh all the prep work and everything that goes into it you know, it's not just a eight or nine hour day. I mean, the time you get everything handled or as much as you can, it's it's a twelve or thirteen hour day. You do that uh, a couple hundred times, it'll it'll wear on you. But uh, you know, I, I just feel like whatever it is, out, even outside of fishing, whatever it is, you need to hire, have that fire. You need to have that um, drive and ambition to kind of push yourself. And uh, and I always want to have that. Like I, I can kind of feel it. Usually about September, October, I'll start kind of getting, not that I'm burnt out, but it's just, I'm, I can tell I need that mental break. I, I need a little getaway and, and some time to, to really not think and stress about it, so to speak. Um, but I think, you know, it's, everybody's a little different. Like I know guys, some of the best fishermen and, and touring guys that literally don't fish unless they're, they're at a tournament. Like, it's amazing to me that, that somebody could go, uh, a month or you know uh, a long period of time and not fish and then still be able to compete at that level so it's it's neat that everybody has their own little system and kind of the way they you know they make it work for them yeah i think guys like uh andy morgan i know he takes a big break and you know yes, he's out yes. in deer woods and you know Absolutely. Just I hunted with him, uh, and... actually opening opening day this year and, and we talked about it, we joked about it. I'm like how in the world can you do that like i everything is, you know, if I, I feel like if I miss three or four days, I'm, I'm off for a couple hours. Like, you know, I, I'm not in that groove and uh, I kind of have to think about things. And, and so I, how do you do that? So, oh man, I don't know what, I don't know how you fish every day. He said, I, I'd get burnt out, you know, I'd get tired. So it's, again, it's, it's what works for you. And, and, and that's what's so cool about fishing is that, man, you can make it whatever you want it to be. You know, it's, we can make this as complicated and as complex or, or as simple as a cork and a cricket, you know, it's, it's really what you want to make it. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I, I realized, I mean, I, I, one of the questions that I had for you was what, what is the difference between, you know, someone that is real successful in a tournament um, versus someone who is just out on the lake fun fishing. And to piggyback off that the day, so, so people on here don't know, I, I got to fish, 
with Jake on Kentucky Lake. The mm-hmm. Super Tournament in the BFL was, it was? Uh-huh. fall of 2023. Um, I fished day one with him, and I got to see uh, I got to see your work ethic. And I think not to, not answering the question for you, but I know one of the things that plays a role in success is the work ethic. You know, the day we fished together, you, you hit at least 50 spots. Right. And you were really working, working hard. Oh. You were, you, when you laid the boat down, there was no, you know, sit around and eat some cheese crackers and idle. Right. So you were up on the trolling motor. And when it was time to move, you were back down sitting on the seat and we were gone. And you did that all day long. I've told a couple people it at three o'clock, you were moving just as fast as you were first thing in the morning. And you were moving like you didn't have anything in the live well, even though yeah. you'd already kind of cold through three limits of fish. But right. that's that's what it takes. It, it know, is, and you know, that it's such a that, that's such a loaded question. I mean, we could we could literally spend the remainder of this podcast, you know, on that question and kind of what revolves and 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 what turns out of that. But uh, you're right. I mean, there's no question the the hard work there, uh, you know, and and kind of the the time that's involved to uh, you know to kind of put all of that together because it's not any. Uh, any one particular thing that makes that it's it's a it's a whole plethora of of things that all kind of come together in unison to you know to make someone or something um you know uh, successful regard again out, outside of fishing or you know whatever it may be so it, it's hard to just say one thing but again i'll have to always refer back to my drive and kind of my passion for this sport and 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 what it brings to me I, i'll be honest and this is up until uh, fairly recently, like I've almost been a little bit embarrassed to uh, admit this to some degree, but the older I get, I, man, I don't, I, I'm getting where I don't care what you think or, you know, what in, 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 you know, good terms, obviously. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is um, uh, like if, man, if I go a week or you can ask my wife, it's, she'd know better than any of us. If I go a week or even just three or four days and don't fish, like you, it, it messes with me. Like I'm off. I don't, I'm not saying I'm down and out, and but I, like I can tell, I'm not my normal self. I'm not mm-hmm. as outgoing. I'm not um, like it is that ingrained into me that um, I, there's very little time of the day uh, that that I'm not doing something revolving around fishing. And so, you know, again, uh, with that passion and kind of that drive, like you're you're able to work that hard and you're able to do things that you know, if maybe, and there's nothing wrong with this, but just kind of the first thing that came to mind, like roofing, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I could stay at that, um, high of a level, you know, uh, as far as like what you were talking about, our speed and, and kind of our, our pace that day. I don't know that I could keep that. It, it's something else, you know, it's, uh, at least not for that duration. Um, but you know, again, I, I feel like, um, you know, my background and, and, and kind of my upbringing was a, a really strong factor in, in kind of who I am today and, and where I am. I was super fortunate. My family uh, grew up in a, in a big fishing family. Uh, basically, all of the, the males, you know, we all fish and, and, and hunt as well. And, and so I was really um, fortunate that I got to see, you know, I got to spend time with my grandfather fishing. I got to go with my Uncle Peter. And, and of course, my dad would take me almost every weekend. And, and so I had a, a, a good little inner circle there at a very, very young age that uh, allowed me to kind of see uh, different aspects of it. And, and again, I was to some degree, and I can't really explain it, but, but to some degree, this is like fishing is like one of the few things that's, it always makes sense to me. Um, you know, everything else is like, you got to work through it. You got to make sense of it and, and whatever the case may be. For whatever reason, since I was, you know, yay tall, it's it's just been natural to me. And I, I've always worked at it, but it's always something that I, I felt natural, whatever it is that's, that's getting thrown at me. So, uh, you know, that upbringing and, and really just, uh, man, I don't know if it's a, a God-given, uh, you know, uh, talent or, or just that natural kind of ability to, I can look at something and analyze it. I, I can kind of almost correlate it to an engineer. Like, I don't have that mind, but but I've talked to those guys and I have several friends and it, it's fun just to watch and listen to those guys kind of work through something. Like if you own a, you know, business calling the truck with them or their mind works in, in their world, just like mine is, you know, in the, in the fishing world. And so it's really cool to, to kind of see that, you know? 
Yeah, I, th I would say definitely natural talent, but uh, work ethic and preparation and putting it Absolutely. all together. You know? Right, right. I mean, there, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, you know, again, uh, the natural uh, ability or, or talent, it, it's not something when I say that, it's not something that that you have to have or something that, um, you know, is, is required by any means. I mean, uh, shoot, I, I know lots of guys that, that this has not been easy for them any step of the way yet. They're still, you know, uh, they, they can go catch a limited fish and, and have a good day. So I, I don't mean that, but it's, it's certainly something that's intrigued me, you know, I, not just again in the fishing world, but you look at, um, you know, other sports and other, uh, industries where and i'm by no means classifying myself into certain titles but like you look at certain guys and you can just tell like that's just natural to them that just fluid it's it feels good to them and i i can have that same resemblance when it comes to this you can show me a new technique and and i don't even some know, sometimes know how but it just give me a little time with it and i'll i'll at least learn something um and kind of kind of have something dialed in with it so the, the work you're, ethic and, and the drive is, is by far, you know, that's going to get you uh, further in, you know, just about anything that you're, that you're, you're into uh, regardless of whatever it is. Were, were your relatives um, the ones that took you fishing? Did they fish bat tournaments as well? Uh, so my, my father uh, fished, you know, club tournaments. Um, he okay. actually won a club tournament the day after I was born, which is kind of cool. It's kind of cool. My wife would let him, or my wife, my mom would, uh, his wife would, would let him go <laughs> yeah. the day after. Yeah, that's I a good born. wife. I think they were still like, I might have still been in the hospital, but he was like leading AOI and <laughs> the whole club story, you know, but he ended up winning that out here in the mouth of Big Sandy. So it's kind of cool. Actually, one of the places is right there. We, we caught a few out, uh, out on like Tennessee Ridge, out, out from Pace Point in that area. That's one place he caught several that day. That's that's kind of weird. I remember that, but uh, obviously just from stories uh, afterwards. But but yeah. So uh, you know, my grandfather and, and uncle are uh, not tournament bass fishermen, but very avid. They're they're very um, you know strong, um, you know into it. Very very passionate and, and spend a ton of time with it. Very good fishermen. They're just that's never been their thing, you know, as far as the, the tournament scene, so to speak. Yeah, got several people on here. Um, just giving a shout out to Bluff City Outdoors and the Collinsville Boat Show. Let's go fishing show. We were, we were up there. JB and I went up there and hung out, and that I got was to, fun. I got man. to hold your bag for a while. That was pretty cool. You got all this stuff in the bag, and he's like, "Hey, hang on a second. Here, hold it." Well, that's from Sean. Sean, <laughs> Sean is, I know. Sean I know. I saw that. Titty Jig Works. Go check them out. But uh, it was fun, man. So last year I went. It was on a Saturday, and it was absolutely bonkers. It was wall to wall, tree top tall, and it was you couldn't hardly talk. You were just bumping into anybody. But on Sunday, it was way more laid back. You know, right. there wasn't there was plenty of people. Yeah, it took it, you three hours to go like 40 yards. Don't worry. Well, I know a lot of people, you know, <laughs> I know a lot of people and I like to talk when I get in that environment. Oh. But it was cool, man. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, what do you got? You got sport any, you know, fishing shows or sports shows and down in your area? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's it's changing the the um, kind of the fishing show, the boat world or the, the boat show world is is has kind of changed. Like I remember growing up as a kid, like in January and February, that's what my grandfather and I did every weekend. You know, we traveled to Jackson Boat Show and Paducah had a good one. Uh, Nashville, I think, had one at a time, you know, at one time. And uh, there are some around, um, you know, I believe the the Murray Boat Show is, is coming up here fairly soon. Um but uh, and and I've actually uh, was supposed to be at one uh, the first week of February, but it actually coincided with that Sam Raven tournament. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to make that unfortunately. But um, but yeah, the, I love going to those boat shows. I, I tell you, one of my favorite things, um, you know, and and Gabe, you're very much the same. Like I almost enjoy being around the industry and in it like you know at that show and and meeting other people with with the same you know interest and 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 generally kind of the same like-minded uh you know thoughts and and uh always great people i really enjoy getting in those atmospheres and and uh and hanging out with those people you know it's man the and i don't this is such a crazy i hate to even go down this road but like where we live now and it's such a crazy time like we it's so little face-to-face -face interaction anymore like i love that i mean 
I'd give anything if, if I was there, you know, in, in the studio with y'all as, as opposed to what we're doing here. And, uh, those boat shows, it's such a great thing for that, you know, such a great opportunity. And I hope that that doesn't kind of fade out. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's certainly something that I'm always interested in going to. And, and I know my boys are always excited when one comes close. Yeah. there, Like you said, you nailed it. There's a big difference in texting somebody or, or even on this channel. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, watch a lot of my videos and they comment and I'm commenting back and forth. And, and that's, that's kind of our relationship. It's a, it's a text type relationship. And right. it's so nice to actually like Stephanie, I, I, She's been supporting this channel for years and years, and I I had yet to meet her. Well, I finally met her out on the lake this summer, and it was really How cool. About that? It was really cool to talk to her. And there's, yeah. you know, like Sean, I met Sean um, at the sports show Sunday, and I yeah. got to talk to him. And the, uh, Andy, there's several people on here that I got to talk to face to face. So it's one thing to just text back and forth and stuff, but it's another thing to actually have a conversation and get to know them and get a feel for them and stuff. So. And that's something that, you know, you might do that at a tournament. Sometimes you, you run into people at tournaments and you talk to them. But um, a sports show is another place to go and, and yes. you know, meet all those people and talk to them. It was fun. This yep. is this is our like our, our weekly dose of that, though. Like, yep. we get to come on here every Tuesday night and, and talk to somebody or eat, hell if oh, it's absolutely. talking to each other. Right. Like and hey, look, look, I, man, I, I bet I listen to. Uh, depending on phone calls, like one to three hours worth of podcasting and, and, and media type uh, stuff almost daily. So like, I'm not, I'm certainly not bashing it. I'm just saying, I, I hope that we don't all get away from that face to face interaction. I, I love getting to meet people and uh, you know, getting to kind of share my wealth and my knowledge that uh, you know, I've been so fortunate to kind of uh, garnish over the last few years and, and um, I, I, regardless of how we do it, it's it's all good as long as it's you know in a positive um, you know frame of mind. But but gosh, I love boat shows and like that BFL. I, man, I, my wife always had to drag me out of the parking lot. Like it was so much fun just hanging out with everybody after the weigh in and and uh, you know whatever it may be. I, I meet so many people at gas stations and and all over the place now that you know that know me and familiar with what I have going on and and. Uh, it's so much fun to be able to take a few minutes and, and get to know a little bit about them. And I've met so many uh, new friends just in the last six months or so, just crazy little things like that. That's really, that's what it's all about. I mean, that's the, the, the friendships that we have, that's, that's what we're going to take with us. And, and um, gosh, I've made some good ones doing this. It's been fun. We you know just what, started too. What I miss is, which we don't have one around here anymore is a local tackle shop. I know it. I know like, it. It's, I know the, it. the old man down there chewing a the fat in the morning, drinking their coffee, and absolutely. absolutely. You know, that's but cool. I'm the world's worst. Like I, I just made a a a, a very hefty uh, you know order to tackle warehouse today, trying to you know get inventory stocked up for for the invitational, and and so I, I mean that's it's tough for these local guys. You know, Kentucky Lake Outdoors, uh, ACS Marine, and and uh, you know Danny there, at Performance Fishing. Uh, they all have great selections, but it's just so hard to compete with those online retailers that have literally everything at your fingertips. You know, it's right. it's just so convenient. And um, I do try to support my local guys when, when I can, but but as busy as I am on the road and, and blowing and going all the time, it's so easy just to get on there and knock it out in a, four, you know, a few minutes and, and, uh, and have it at the front door for sure. Yeah, I agree. Like, like you said, it's hard to stock everything. It's just – well, first of all – the overhead. Secondly, the floor space. You know, you just can't, you, you just can't keep it all. It's just right. it's, it's it tough. Is. It is. It's and tough. there's always somebody that comes in for a certain oddball color, and they can't find it because you, right. I mean, you, you might have forty different colors of of a Zoom speed crawl, but they're looking for that forty first one. You don't have the, it. the one you don't have. Absolutely. Right. Right. Well, and and unfortunately, like we're we're seeing it every day. We saw it with our local fishing tackle shop that that shut down years ago, but there's just you can't compete right like, right right absolutely wh whether absolutely. it's the whether it's the academies the walmarts the bass pro shops the tackle warehouses the bait works the omnias all of those online retailers some of them have great presence you know bait works is great in the ozarks it's a great spot to absolutely. go absolutely yeah it's a great great that's, uh, uh that's drew sanford isn't it is that Springfield. Drew? Yeah. yeah 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 so i met drew a few years ago drew's a great guy i like uh I like Drew and, and his wife, uh, Brittany, I believe. And, 
uh, man, they've got a great family. That's a that's a really cool crew over there uh, at yeah. Bayworks. Bayworks is really growing. They got a lot of. I just got off the phone um, with Jacob the other night. We were just talking about 2024, and um, it's going to continue to expand. And it's um, it's in Springfield. And if you're ever, I know the big draw in Springfield is Bass Pro Shops. But if you're in if you're in Springfield, make sure you go by Bayworks. I will, have, man. I wish I would have known that last. They got time. a lot of cool stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. I'd have gone cool by at the, at the Toyota Championship. Yeah, you know, the great thing about Bayworks is got a little bit of both, right? It's got the local feel. When right. you're in the Springfield area, but then they have the great online presence as well. Right, so, right. How about that? Good place to, I'll check that out. Good place to go. And they got enough. You know, it's a big enough place that they have um, a lot more stuff than just a smaller, you know, mom and pop type. Right. Like, nothing against those places. But like we were talking about, they're big enough that they can have a, a, a little bit better variety than a lot of smaller Correct, places. correct. And it's, uh, it's convenient. Um, so what all are you fishing this year? Man, so we're, we've got a busy schedule ahead of us. Uh, we're going to fish the MLF Invitationals, uh, the Plains Division Toyota Series, uh, as well as the uh, LBL Division uh, of the BFLs, at least the ones that we can, uh, you know, be here for. Uh, I, I, the regional is on Pickwick this fall, and so that's obviously, uh, you know, something that I – I would love to get down there and have a shot at. And uh, so we're going to try to make as many of these BFLs as we can, try to make a regional. Um, I've actually, I, so I, I've always, um, like a lot of guys have asked me here in the last, you know, six or eight months or so, you know, kind of like where, where have I come from or, you know, that sort of thing kind of coming out of nowhere and, uh, you know, and ask why, why is this year the first year that I've kind of fished tournaments? And, and I really haven't, I've always fished tournaments. However, uh, you know, this is uh, how I provide for my family. This is how I make a living. And, and um, so I, I have to look at this um, quite a bit differently than, you know, than most guys. If you've got a, a nine to five Monday through Friday, uh, if we lose a couple hundred bucks this weekend, six, seven hundred bucks, it's not the end of the world. You know, that's a that's a big setback. Like I, I everything is, is um, you know, calculated and, and uh, is at least as much as you can in the bass fishing you know the tournament world but right um it just never really made much sense um you know until this year to to do the bfls and a lot of these bigger tournaments i, I fished a few toyotas or excuse me the costas back then it's the, the toyota series um uh and i actually won one back in 18 but it just again i always felt like once i did the numbers like i could make more money here you know at home as opposed to to traveling regionally but but things have changed, and, and uh, you know, I, I guess it was uh, probably March or so. No, it was just after the Toyota win this year. My wife came to me and said, look, I know this is, you know, more or less just sat me down and said, I know this is what you've always wanted to do. Uh, there's never been any question. Like, if you want to do it, this is the time. Let's do it. You know, let's, let's not get 60 and then figure out that, you know, we should have or could have or, you know, whatever it may be. So, we really kind of started taking that leap uh, and kind of looking into things, getting serious about it in, in April. And, and man, things have really taken off since then. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, you think you've, you, you kind of know what to expect. Um, but boy, when you get in there, it's, it's kind of a whole new, you know, I don't want to say a whole new world, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, a commitment, it's, isn't it? You start looking at the figures and you're like, Whoa, that's it's a, a lot of it's money. A, it's a, a leap expenses. of faith is what it yeah, is. It is. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And, yeah, uh, you know you want it. There ain't no doubt about that. But you start looking at that real, the real dollars and cents and stuff. And absolutely. I know even when, even when we fished together, you were still, you hadn't hundred percent committed in your brain because we talked, we talked a little bit about it. And you right, said you, right. you, you, you were still, still thinking hard I mean, about the invitationals. But right, right. I mean, when I when I say we kind of put everything into motion, you know, there's certain things that had to happen and, and things that needed to fall into place to make this work. Mm -hmm. um and 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 that kind of had happened but i i'll be honest with you just like gabe uh you know elaborated on like it was what that was in september and i was still kind of like i'll be honest i had kind of made my mind up but i was like trying to talk myself out of it make sure this is exactly what you know yeah. what we wanted to do and I, again i'm one of those guys once i make my mind up there's no turn really turning me back i'm i'm wide open um you know as, as hard as we can go well, you but had to say it out loud. That was you the still, right decision yeah. before we, you know, got that far into that kind of that tunnel vision, so to speak. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's one, it's, you make your mind up, but you, but you still got to say it out loud to uh, people. And then, and then, and then you're accountable. You're holding yourself accountable. Exactly. You it out loud. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, but I'm super, super, super excited, uh, you know, for the season. The first one's there at, at Sam Rayburn. You know, another really big contributing factor into to fishing the invitation is just how well that schedule set up. I mean, that's a, one of, regardless of, um, you know, which circuit or which even series, like that's one of the best uh, schedules that I've seen in a long time. Um, so, I, you know, that definitely helped I, – Again, I'm all for, and in fact, one of my favorite things is to, uh, you know, to go to a new body of water and, and to break it down and to kind of figure it out. Uh, so it's not that I'm intimidated by that or, or don't want to do that, but it's, um, you know, looking at the schedule, there's very few, you know, there's no Florida lakes, there's very little grass, a little bit on Eufaula, um, you know, maybe a little bit, you get into the sand grass up there, you know, St. Clair and that sort of thing, but not a big grass schedule doesn't really look to be a, a super big spawn tournament. I, we are going to have a couple like the, the West point. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know much about West point, but just looking at it kind of where it lays could be some spawning there. Kentucky Lake could be, you know, some spawning the tail end of it at Ufaba, but all of those tournaments, I feel like the spawning game, it, although it may be, taking place to some degree that's most likely not going to be what it takes to win and, and really how the majority of the field is going to catch them. So uh, everything really kind of lines up good, you know, sets up good for kind of the way that I like to fish. And, you know, a big um, misconception that I guess I, I've kind of uh, garnered over the last year or so, or, or maybe two years is that, you know, uh, the only way that I like to fish is, is to live scope. And I'll tell you, I, I look nothing, uh, you know, forward, nothing more than to go skipping a frog up under a bush or, or um, you know, flip a jig around a cypress tree or whatever it may be. But I'll tell you, in, in this day and time, um, with where we're at, I just can't, outside of, uh, you know, a high water conditions, like I just can't see live scope not coming into some factor. Like I can't, in other words, you take me on the, on the same body of water two days in a row, like I'm I'm almost never going to beat myself without live scope, you know, with and without. I mean, it's mm -hmm. until that day when I feel like I can I can catch a better in a tournament with it, uh, or, or excuse me, without it. Um, you know, I, that's what I'm going to keep doing. And so, I, I like the way the schedule sets up. I think it's going to be a scopers deal most of the season, and and uh, fits right up my alley. It's, it's something that I've gotten really good at over the last couple of years. It's, um, it's fun. Don't get me wrong, but it's, um, I don't know. It's, uh, like Gabe got to see it that day. Like I, I'm kind of getting, I don't know. What's the word? Um, I don't know. It's everything's kind of bland. Like I'm I, again, super fortunate. Like I've just, I've seen it. I've done it enough with the scope. Yeah, right. It's, it's one thing to, you know, it, I, I just, I miss that excitement of not knowing I'm fixing to get a bite. Like how many times to that day, I would say a lot of times, even before I made the cast, like I'm fixing to catch this one, but yeah. I would for sure say, Oh, here he comes, you know, five feet before he got to my bait. And there's just a different vibe that comes with that. It's, it's fun. I enjoy, I'll tell you one thing with live scope that, that has been critical and something that I've, I've really, um, it's kind of ratcheted um, my learning curve up. Like, and, and Gabe and I talked a little bit about this during the tournament, but, you know, used to, you had to go get a bite to learn anything um, or spend a long time doing one thing without a bite to say, okay, that's not, you know, not what's happening. Uh, but now with scope, it's, it's so much more efficient. It's so fast to zip through an area. And, and I'm not saying that I'm not going to miss a few, but I'm going to be able to know very quickly whether, you know, this area is kind of active or, or if things are dead or, or, you know, just whatever the case may be, whatever's happening, we know very quickly now there's not really much guesswork and um that's one uh aspect to the live scope that i feel like doesn't get talked as much about like as far as just we're not talking about finding our our uh, you know a bass and 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 casting our bait to it i just mean put the trolling motor down uh and pan that transducer around and see what's happening is there bait around is there bluegill is is there life i don't care if it's drum you know i just i, I need to see some sort of life something going on and if you don't see that, it doesn't take you very long to figure out uh, we need to go somewhere else, you know. So it's just 
it's really neat to to be able to uh, to take that information uh, and compile it, compress it down. Again, like I was able to go to Rayburn, hadn't been there in five or six years, only spent like two days on Rayburn uh, ever. And within an hour, I pretty well knew what was going on. I'm not saying it was the winning gig. I'm not saying it was the, I could catch a 40 pound bag, but I, I could catch them pretty good. I mean, it was not hard. Um, and so without live scope, like I, it, what they were doing was not what I thought they would have been doing. And I wouldn't have been able to figure that out, especially in an hour's time without it. Um, okay. So, so, so back up just a second. So when you went down to Rayburn and I know you got a tournament down there, so you don't have to give up any spots. Yeah, no, 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 what, what was your, uh, what was your process of going to a new lake? Did you, so did you have some spots picked out before you went down there? You know, you did a little bit of homework at the house and then side scan idle and then throw the, you know, the trolling motor down and look around or how do you approach a, a new lake? Yeah. So I, I really try to go into, um, I, I try to go into every day, even if it's uh, Kentucky Lake, um, you know, fished here several thousand days. Like I try to go out, even though it's my home lake, uh, I try to go out with this mindset of, um, you know, a new lake. This is a new day. The, the fish are doing something different. Uh, with this open mindset of um, I'm not going to fish a spot because I've caught them there before. I'm going to fish a spot. I may already know about it, but I'm going to fish it because I know the fish should be there because of this, this, and this, w whatever the case may be. So like um, going to Rayburn, I, I really don't make that big of a deal out of it. Like in my head, I guess, like mentally prep work wise, I, I guess um, I don't spend a tremendous amount of time like Google Earth. And then I, I do as needed, like if it's a grass lake and you can see the grass on Google Earth, of course, I'll spend some time. But like, I, I'm not one of those guys that um, spends hours and hours and hours combing through things. I, I found that my instincts and kind of my gut feeling is generally a lot better than like my, um, I don't want to say intuition, but like if I sit down with a map and I look at it and go, this place and this place and this place look good. Very rarely when I ever get to the lake, are those two or three places ever any good? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It just never works out that way. However, and this could all just be, you know, a mental thing in my mind. If I put the boat in the water with somewhat of like a fresh, I don't have any place in mind that I'm going, just kind of looking around and kind of getting a feel for it. Like I, I just kind of got this gut feeling of based on all the, experiences that I've had in my past, I kind of compile all of that information, compress all of that down into what I'm seeing in front of me. And it, it just seems to uh, speed my, um, you know, practice up, like my, my finding abilities. What I found is when I did a lot of prep work, I would end up spending like a half a day or maybe even a full day of practice trying to look at all that stuff that I was looking at on the map and Google Earth and this and that. And again, for whatever reason, the way for me, very little of that stuff ever worked out. I would always end up, you know, ditching that stuff at one o'clock. And from one to dark, I found what I needed to find, you know, just running around and kind of fishing the way I needed to fish. So I do it a lot more instinctually. Again, I feel like that is that's something that comes with a little time. Like it's hard to, and it's hard for me to even wrap. Uh, like put into words kind of how what is fishing instinctually but it is uh, in essence taking all of your past experiences and and using those towards what you see you know what's in front of you uh, but but really what I wanted to do um, you know again this is a pre-practice scouting trip 31 or two days ahead of time um, so my biggest thing going down is that I don't actually want to catch very many and I don't want to get too dialed into exactly what the fish are are, are doing right now. I, I want to know where they're at, but I don't really want to get my mind so wrapped into uh, their own isolated clumps of hydrilla, you know, in the back of the bays or w whatever the, you know, the pattern may be, because it's almost never going to be the same, certainly not 30 days later. But but what I like to do is just go down and get a, a good feel of the lake. I, I want to learn, you know, uh, again, learn how to navigate Rayburn with a lot of the standing timber and the lake being yeah. seven feet low. That's a big part of it. Just the actual navigation, getting to and from uh, is a big obstacle there. But but I really wanted to, uh, you know, get a good uh, 
layout, kind of see how things looked. And, and uh, again, when I was there five or six years ago, the lake was up like a foot or so over summer pool. Things were very different. It was in the summer and, and really things were nothing like what I knew this would set up. So I spent a, probably 90% of my time uh, behind the wheel idling around. And, and again, just kind of assessing, uh, you know, knowing or anticipating where I think they're going to be headed. Um, and, and those kinds of places uh, is really what I spent the majority of my time looking for. Uh, I did, to be honest with you, I didn't find exactly like what I thought going down there. I was, I was idling around and looking for, I really didn't see a whole lot of, but I, I saw some other things that I really liked. So uh, I think it's going to be a great tournament. Um, you know, it's been a, a great place to start the year off. Um, I'm not a huge Florida guy. I love going down there and fishing, but it's it, from a tournament aspect, it's such a scary place because we're all right here. We all know, like, take Okeechobee, like, I, I'm going to mess this up, but just say 30% of the population lives in the monkey box in spring. You know, mm -hmm. this time of year, for the next two months, that's where they're going to be. And so if you're, if you're going to do well, you're going to be in one of, like, a couple areas. And, man, you could be in a winning area and just not catch them down there. Um, so I, I'm – glad that we avoided the Florida deal and, um, you know, got to something that's uh, a little more comfortable and, and kind of shake those first tournament jitters of the year off and, and something that's a little familiar. But I, I think the lakes, the weights may not be like astronomical. It may not be, you know, some record breaking deal, but, but I think it's going to be a very good tournament. There's going to be a lot of fish caught. However, I do feel like there will be, um, and I hate to say drama, but I, I there it will fish tight. I, there's going to be guys fishing on top of each other. It's just everything's consolidated down. It, you know, seven feet doesn't sound like a whole lot, but to a lake that's extremely flat like Rayburn, seven feet is a long way. Like it, it was, I would be scanning along uh, in a in a drain, and, and there would be clay mud for a quarter mile till you got to the actual original shoreline. And and again, that's only seven feet, so it's it's a uh, it's going to be fun, but it's going to be a little different for uh, a lot of the guys that have been there a lot too, and I like that. Yeah. So breaking down a lake, whether it's Rayburn, whether it's going out on in your backyard at Kentucky Lake, and and coming out with it with a a fresh mind or a new outlook <laughs> on it, walk us through like your process of taking a point, taking a brush pile, taking a an area. Do you scan it? Do you drop your trolling motor immediately. What, I mean, because prior to, it's always been, you know, you go over it, you scan it a couple times, you mark your brush piles, you might spin around and, and scope it a little bit and find your area, how you're going to set up on it. And then you may leave and go do that milk run for an hour if you're practicing, if you're finding an area. But walk us through, like, finding that spot and then maybe the next day of, of fishing that spot. Yes, yes. So, um a big part of my practice, uh, um, and and I say practice, but let's not put emphasis on a tournament practice. Yeah. But let's face it, every day that we go fishing, at least for the first little bit, it's practice. We, we, we've got to figure out what's going on and, and kind of where they're at, how they're set up. Um, so this really applies to every day that I go fishing. Um, but it's the, the most important thing to me personally is that I want to cover as much water as efficiently as I can um, to get. So the more that I see, the more that I know. And and let me stop here and 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 say that um, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes that that we as fishermen make, and something that I've learned in the last two years, that's really kind of elevated and and kind of helped me um, just dial things in a lot faster is to be able to take um you know a stretch um where i didn't catch them where they're not at and be able to because they're not here they must be over here or they must be doing this or that whatever the the, the conditions you know call for or, or the pattern may be rather um I'm able to, you know, for so long, I was always practicing to find the fish. Well, now, and I am still, but I'm also, every stop, it's like putting more and more of that puzzle, you know, that jigsaw together. And and if I didn't get a bite uh, here or see any, if we're scoping, like I learned just as much from that as I did 
uh, you know, catching 20 pounds down a stretch. Um, it, it just helps me, helps to draw a picture for me to, to further my decisions, you know, uh, in the future. But, but really, you know, in essence, I want to cover as much water as possible to see as much of that. And what I mean is, when I say cover water, I, I don't necessarily mean put the troll motor down on eight and, and, and go for 10 miles. Like I want to, when I first get to a body of water, I want to, um, I'm going to get generic here just for uh, ease sake, but let, I'm going to stop on a, a, a main lake point. Um, maybe it's a, a big bluffy chunk rock point. Uh, say I don't get a bite there. Now I'm going to run in a bay and look at a, a channel swing. Uh, don't get a bite there. I'm going to go fish the little ditch in the back of the, you know, the, the drain in the back of the bay, get two or three bites there. Okay. Well, there, there wasn't anything way out in the main lake. There wasn't any, you know, halfway back on the drains, but they're on the, or excuse me, on the, the channel swings, but they're in the drains in the back. Well, that's not going to be the only place they are, but that tells me that they're in kind of that zone. And so now I may look for the last little flat points right before you get to the drains or again, there's so many variables that you could run with, but from not seeing them on that main lake point and not seeing them on a, a Creek channel swing, I'm still bouncing ideas. If they're not here, they must be doing this. If they're not doing that, you know, uh, let's try this. And I feel like um, as anglers, we get so dialed into how we have caught them and how, um, you know, how they uh, used to set up on this spot or, you know, we put way too much emphasis on our spots. Um, and, and those are great places to fish. And obviously, uh, fish live there, you wouldn't catch them. But uh, I, I just, I would like for people to have a little different uh, outlook on that spot. Like, it's not a good spot because you caught them there. It's a good spot because when uh, the water temperature is warming up, uh, you've got a creek channel that swings next to this flat point. And they'll stage on this little shallow flat point while it's warm and they've got the creek channel right next to them. You know, it's not that you caught them there in March. It's that you caught them there on a warming trend and they're all pushing up and like, it's just a different mindset. And what it does is it eliminates this running from waypoint to waypoint with no real reasoning uh, behind why you're doing that other than just, you've gotten a bite there before. But um, you know, again, covering water, um, paying attention to your surroundings as far as, you know, your live scope and even the guys that don't have it, or if you're fishing too, high, you know, too shallow to use live scope, you know, if, if you pull into the back of a pocket and there's no herons and, and no bluegill popping and kind of nothing happening, like we've all done that before. You kind of go, uh Oh, you know, this doesn't look good. And you give it 10 minutes and, and you say, all right, let's roll. This isn't happening. That's essentially what I'm doing with live scope. Uh, I'm just, you know, utilizing the screen and, and what it's showing me as opposed to our eyes. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's not something that uh, there's one right or wrong way to do it by any means. It's just, uh, uh, you know, a way that kind of a system that I've got in my head. Again, so much of it goes back to instinct and just that past experience. And there's really very little way to... Uh, to get around that time on the water. I mean, you ask almost any question is going to revolve back to, you know, some experience that we've all had. Well, you wouldn't have had that without that time on the water. And, and, uh, and, you know, that's the cool thing with these podcasts and, and, and all the, the media outlets that are out there today is, you know, we don't, we're not always able to, to, to be out there every day. And, and, uh, you know, we've got some bad weather coming in the next uh, few weeks. Like we're all going to spend a ton of time, uh, listening to these podcasts and things like that. And, and, and we can learn a lot from that, you know, um, uh, you know, on those days that we can't get out. And, and that's always, um, you know, something that I look forward to doing as well. I think one of the things that, that you really nailed there is, is being so efficient, being more efficient on the water um, instead of, and we've talked about this in the past, but instead of, you know, pulling into a bay and fishing from the point all the way to the back and back out the other side, that can take you three hours or more, you know, find a little stretch, sample it, you know, spend 10 minutes there, boom, bounce, bounce around, try right. to figure out what locations, what areas, and then, then try to fine tune your bait selection. And right, just being, right. Just being more efficient with your time is, 
That's so I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought that up because it, it brings up a great point. Like, uh, and I guess I, I kind of got off in, in right field there, but but that's another great aspect to it because, uh, like, take for instance, we've got a, a a pocket with a string of bushes in the back of it. Like, we've all pulled in there, and you see that one bush that's sticking out like two feet further than all the rest of them, or it's the big button ball bush, the biggest one in the pocket. Like, you pretty well know if there's a bass anywhere, you know, in this pocket, he should be on that bush. Right, right. So like, I'm not going to start on the opposite side of the pocket over there and fish 482 bushes to get to that one. Yep. I'm not saying I'm going to pull right up to that one, and if I don't get a bite in that one, I'm leaving. I, I don't mean that. But in my mind, when I come to a key target or a key uh, piece of structure or, or whatever it may be, uh, and I don't get a bite there, I immediately go, uh-oh. Like, it doesn't take me just a second to go, okay, if there were several bass in this area, one would have been right there. Right. Um, and, and sometimes it, he is, and you just didn't get him to bite. But, but again, it's it's things like that, that that I've learned that just make me a little bit more efficient. I'm making those decisions um, just a little bit faster, you know, from small little things like that. You know, just going into a, a, an area and, and like you said, don't fish the whole thing. Again, in practice, we don't need to catch every bass. All we're doing is just looking to figure out kind of the general area and, and, and the general patterns that they're doing. Um, so I don't want to go through a whole pocket. I'm going to hit kind of the high percentage places and, and bounce through. And, and, you know, if if I caught a few, if there, you know, if I felt like there were a few in that area, tomorrow in the tournament, I may slow down and, and count the rocks in that pocket if I think I need to. But in practice, I'm I'm really not so worried or concerned about catching, and I know everybody says this, but catching a ton. Like, if I can catch one or two doing something, two or three, like enough pretty quick to give me some confidence, man, I'll quit doing it. Like, I, I won't, if I'm catching them on secondary points um, in practice, I'm not just going to keep running secondary points because I already know I'm most likely going to get bit. Like that's, that's what they're on. That's what, that's what we're catching them on. So instead, and this is something that, again, that I've kind of changed in the last couple of years. And it's, it's really seemed to help is like, as soon as I'm confident that I've figured out what that pattern is and, and the kind of the happening thing, I'll actually completely avoid that the rest of practice and go try to find other things. And, and oftentimes you'll, you'll waste a bunch of time and you, you'll revert back to whatever's happening and um, you know, and, and proceed uh, along. But s- Oftentimes, I, and I can count several times this year in tournaments, I won specifically because of that. Like I, I established a pretty dominant pattern, and then I said, okay, I've got, you know, six more hours of practice. I'm going to go um, do X, Y, Z or this or that, whatever it may be. Maybe not something uh, totally, you know, a custom or, or maybe not something we're supposed to be doing at that time. And win, you know, and there they are. That's what what's happening, and and uh, and really blow the field out. So, you know, all of those go kind of go hand in hand. Really, it all goes back to you know your very first question. I mean, it's it, it all. There's so much uh, that goes into this sport, and it's one thing that really excites me about it. Is like it's I never really feel like you master it. Uh, you know, you ask Van Dam today, and he'll he'll you know, uh, he'll be the first to tell you that he's still got something to learn. I mean, we, we all do and, and we always will. So, um, that to me, uh, learning and, you know, I, again, super fortunate, caught a ton of bass, reeled a ton of bass in. Like I, I like that aspect of it as part of it and it's fun, but to me, the learning and the, like to figure out what that bass is doing and why he's doing it is really what, that's what drives me. I think, I think we, you said that perfectly. <clears throat> Two things here. One, we as amateurs forget to not just go fish the 722 miles of bank or offshore spots or whatever and expect the same results when we're not catching something, right? Like right. we're not putting the pattern together. We're fishing what like you said, we're fishing. Right. You're just you're just fishing. Right. Right. Yeah, and they're, they're, and they're, well, well, okay, so check this out. Here, here's something that I that I've been correcting as a fisherman personally, and I've been working on this for the last four or five years, and I'm getting better at it, but it's you got a spot where you let's say this is in a tournament. You got a you got a lay down where you there it's holding fish. Well, you're gonna run to that lay down. Well, sometimes a person might have a tendency to expand that little area. Like mm-hmm. instead of instead of going right to the juice, stop in and fishing 50 yards or 100 yards on either side of that. Well, that takes yep. 
that takes an, a, an additional 20 minutes and you do that four or five, six times a day and you, right. you've blown several hours where exactly. you get a habit of going right to the juice because you've done yeah. your homework. You're going to be much more efficient. You're going to put yourself. Correct. In Correct. Most of the time, um, most of the time, the guy that wins uh, is the guy that kept his bait in the strike zone longer. Or even the guy that beats, the, you know, how many uh, times is the guy in the back of the boat, you know, uh, out caught the boater uh, or the guy in the front? In some way, shape, or form, he's keeping his bait in the strike zone longer or better or, you know, there, there's something to it. And uh, you're exactly right. Being able to kind of refine this down and to spend as much time with your bait in front of them as possible it seems so cliche and so silly, but it is, it's amazing how like the, the outcome uh, from just a little bit more time, you know, like what you're talking about, 10 minutes here, five minutes there, like at the end of the day, it all adds up. Um, and, and that's one thing I'm not, uh, and this bites me sometimes, uh, particularly in Florida, uh, but I'm a, an extremely impatient fisherman. Like it's, they need to bite. It's I'm I'm blowing and going until I find one that bites, and when the next one doesn't, I'm off to the next, you know to, to the next location. And um, I'm not great at uh, doing that. Like say, okay, I know there's some in this uh, laydown, but once I spook them out of this laydown, they've got to go somewhere up and down this bank, and I'm gonna sit here. I don't know anywhere else to go. I'm going to sit in this 50 yard stretch and try to make one of these bites. Like I just can't do it. He's yeah. got about five minutes and I'm out. <laughs> I, just, I just can't, I can't handle it. It makes me nervous just thinking about that. Um, but again, I, I've seen, and I know a lot of guys that, uh, man, they can make that work. They can somehow cover just enough water to find some fish in, 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 uh, in practice and milk it for every single bass that's living there and, and make it work. But I, tend to lean more on that. I, I'm going to cover as much water. I know I'm leaving a bunch behind. I, I am. I mean, I'm really just trying to target the most aggressive ones. And uh, and my idea is like, I'm, I'm going to blow through here and catch what wants to bite. Uh, and what doesn't, I'll just come back. In theory, I'm moving fast enough. I should be able to have plenty of time to come back and, and catch another little batch of them that's gotten aggressive since I've left. So well, it doesn't always work out, but it's it's just kind of my mentality and the way that I like to like to do it. Yeah, if you do your practice right, though, and especially in a multi-day event, right? We're not BFLs are one thing, but fishing a a multi-day, two, three, four-day event. If you put your work in for three days of practice and you hit all those spots and you pull up to that bush on day one of the tournament, and he's not there. Your homework should tell you where he went, right? Not correct, to, correct. It, at least give you a good starting point. I mean, you know. It's well, like, you, you start start rolling back over. If they're not on those secondary right. points going into a creek, where did they go? Did they go to the front or did they go to the back? You got two options. It, exactly, exactly. And based on, on what you've seen, have you seen more bait in the back of the bay? You have should you know seen, where they're going, yeah. right? You're right, right. Been. It's there, yeah. There's information that um that will you know steer you give you an educated guess um, yeah right and and that's something that uh you know that that I, another thing that and i, and I don't want to seem like i'm harping on this but uh, another common mistake is that uh, you know when we get a bite and and i i think Abe and i talked about this um during the tournament a little bit but like so many times i see guys get and gals alike get excited of course when they catch one like so excited that they can't wait to take them off the hook and, and re-rig their, their plastic and, and get it back in there as quick as possible. Try to get another bite. But I really encourage at least uh, in the beginning to stop. Once you get that bite and you get them off the hook and take your picture and put them back, uh, I encourage you to stop and think, what you know, what was I doing when I got that bite? Was I hopping that jig? Was I dragging it? Was it right up on the bank when he bit it? Was it halfway back? You know, there, there's where at was he on the – flat side of the point or on the front side was he on the back side the steep part the flat spot you know there's so many variables that you can quickly assess in a matter of like five to ten seconds uh, this is not something you've got to sit down and meditate and you know spend a lot of time but if you'll just take a few seconds and go why what when and where you know as far as that particular bite that you just got you'll learn so much it's it's we over 
I don't say we overthink it, but like we're, it's almost like you're underthinking it. Like it's right. Yeah. It makes so much sense when you just ask yourself, why is that fish there? Well, it's cold. And I know that he doesn't want to swim very far. So he wants a steep, you know, uh, 45 degree angle bank to move up and down on. And, uh, you know, there, there's gizzard shad realm and whatever the, the, the situation is, there's generally enough information there that will give you more of a clue than what you had prior. You just have to look and ask yourself, you know, what it is. And, and before long, like, and I know it seems so silly, like you feel weird doing that, but before long, you don't even have to think about it. Like, it's just, as I'm reeling the fish in, I'm already processing that information. Yeah. It's um, like a, if you're fishing a, around here, we got a lot of grass. So you're fish. it's not uncommon to, to fit, to just pitch a plastic along the out the very mm-hmm. foot inside the grass and just work that outside grass line. You, you may go for a while, not get a, not get a bite. And then maybe you just make kind of a halfway bad cast and it lands 10 feet off the grass line. And then you get a bite. Yeah. You get like, okay. well, they're not on they're not right on the grass well, just sitting out off the that's grass. the difference of, of well, someone that's thinking about it that's what i'm saying that's, that's my that's life. why you got to be paying exactly. attention when you get that exactly. bite and uh you know i, I do that all the time you know when and that's, I get that certain bite it's a clue yeah absolutely and that that leads me to another like you hear a lot of guys saying you know the pattern within the pattern so like take that same example um you're catching them on a wacky rig you know on the outside of that grass like 10 to 20 feet outside the grass well, it's one thing for you to call me up and say, man, dude, I've wrecked them. You've got to come over here. This is all you got to do is chunk a wacky rig around uh, the outside edge of the grass. Well, I go over there and I'm throwing my wacky rig, you know, six inches a foot from the, the edge of the grass and I don't get a bite. Right. It's two totally different deals. It's one thing to say you're fishing the outside edge of that grass. It's a whole nother thing to say they're 10 to 20, you know, feet out from it. They're about halfway down, you know, yada, 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 whatever it is. That's the dialing in the pattern within the pattern. It's not that they're on points uh, or, or it's not that they're on docks. It's that they're on boat docks that are on secondary points, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Or it's Well, not well that and that line. grass, Jake, that grass line, you can see that visible grass line, mm-hmm. but 20 feet out off that visible grass line, there's still a little bit of grass still, down there. Yeah, yeah. So, so are they out in that deeper, stuff. that deeper, uh-huh. shorter grass or somewhere? Are, they, are they out there when it turns into rock and there ain't nothing out there? Yeah. And, and then that, then there's right. the bottom contour t- thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're getting bites um, in a little bit harder stuff. There might be just a little bit of a hard yep. stuff mixed in there. There's a lot going on, but but just to keep it basic that like you said there is a there are a lot of times where you just need to be you're in the right area you're just fishing a little too shallow or, or yep. a little too deep or you're just missing one little bitty thing and exactly. however you figure that out you need to make sure you're paying attention when you do figure it out and, and repeat that because that can you that just, can that can make a horrible day really good you just tell them you're catching really on the right. grass and you just keep on going down the lake yeah just <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> How many times have we done it though? I mean, you know, uh, we get a bite. Like I, I, I did just this fall. Um, it was probably late November. Um, I had a had a trip. Uh, me and a buddy went out and 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 didn't have a great day. We we caught a bunch of fish. We just didn't catch any big ones. I caught one good one, and it was on uh, the last little channel swing in the back of a bay uh, on the east side of the river over here. And and. I mean, I did it in like the first two hours, you know, of us being on the water, but I just never put all of that together. And we spent the rest of the day running around doing everything except that you get in. And sure enough, that's how, you know, two or three guys caught a couple big bags that day. And, you know, I mean, you felt like it was so hard and so difficult, yet it, it's not. And and that's, you know, that's another thing that, um, that, that I've learned or, or kind of a – an instinct, a feeling, a gut feeling that I've, I've started to get lately is, is, uh, it's just knowing, uh, you know, when that's not happening and, and kind of, um, you know, being able to, um, completely bail on it and, and still be confident, like still know that everything's going to be fine. We're, you, you find them every day. What, this is no different just because it's a tournament doesn't mean you've got to go fish these exact places that they have been on. I mean, it's so rare that they stay consistent doing the same thing. Um, maybe not necessarily like the same, they may stay on the same place, but as far as how they're set up, you know, one day the sun's out and they may get real high in the water column. The next day 
it's raining and they're all glued to the bottom or, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different conditions that will dictate, you know, their mood and, and how they set up. But, but it's, it's gotten to where, you know, I really almost like, I want to be dialed in a tournament. I want to know what's going on, but I almost don't want to have this big plan in my head. Like I, I remember when you and I fished that tournament, like, I think I knew where we wanted to start, but beyond that, I had an idea, but it wasn't like I'm going to hit A, B, C, and if that doesn't work, I'm running down here to do this. It was just kind of, man, we're just going to go fishing. I mean, you know, it's I have a general idea. I knew some of those smallmouth were relating to those shallow bars out there, and um, the, the water level was not really right for the top water uh, gig to, to really get going yet. Um, but it was still late enough in the year where the, the summertime, the real deep offshore stuff doesn't play much that time of year. And so I kind of had a general, like I knew where in the lake and where in the water column they were going to be. It's just a matter of us running around covering enough water. To, well, to I, I agree. Out. You, you, one thing, one thing I noticed about that day we fished, and I thought it was funny is you'd be on the West side of the lake. And then instead of going up a half a mile on the west side of the lake, you'd shoot all the way across over to the east side of the lake, fish some, and then you'd shoot back over to the west. We were going, we were just, we were going, like you said, oh, we were we, just going I bet all we over the lake. And, miles east to west that day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. And that's because you, right, you, you, you were just again, fishing the moment. Just, uh, you know, that's a, a feeling. Like, I, you know, uh, I've got so many places out here on Kentucky Lake. To some degree, it's almost a nuisance. You know, I can't get to where I'm going without you know, running past 10 places, I kind of want to stop at, so to speak. But, um, but, you know, I was just that morning, uh, that was the first day, wasn't it? That was day yeah. one. Day yeah. one yep. uh, and, and so like, again, I, I had had a, had a pretty good idea what was going to, you know, happen, but I didn't know where. And, and so I just knew, man, keep the trolling motor, uh, you know, in the water and, and keep moving and, and bouncing around. You know, we fished several different patterns that day. It was all kind of in that like five to 10 foot range, but it was, we fished some on the bank. We fished some way out in the middle, uh, you know, uh, some around, uh, you know, in behind the islands. We, we did a lot of different things that day to bounce around and kind of catch what we did. But, um, but I, I, you know, I feel like, being able to to fish loose like that like you hear john cox talk about it all the time and, and i pick on john anytime we we hang out and talk because it's just like how can you be that laid back like he's that way about everything like i've never met anybody that will drive 20 hours and doesn't even have a place to stay like he's just gonna roll into town and figure something out yeah. like that i couldn't even imagine doing that but anyway john is he's I, he's so laid back that it's almost like he doesn't allow himself to get stressed and worked up and like kind of caught up in that, you know, anxiety of what do I do? What if this doesn't work? John more or less just goes fishing and has fun. And he knows that at some point during the day, he's going to get a few opportunities. And, you know, as long as he executes and, and makes the right decisions, he's going to have a good day. And, and, um, and oftentimes he does, he pulls it out of nothing. Like, if you watch John on live, you think, man, this guy is a, and he, he is one of the best fishermen, but you'd think this guy never not finds them. He never finds them. Like, I, I shouldn't say that's not fair, but like, he's never on them. Like he makes it look like he's on them. He's never dialed. Like he, he just fishes by the seat of his pants and, and, and just kind of, uh, again, it's instinctually, but it's free. He's just yep. kind of rolling with, with what he sees and, and what he thinks, you know, he can get the next bite on. Well, you talked about really fun watching at the beginning. You talked about like the hard work that you do to put in the time to, to have all the effort hours that you have, whether it's honing, honing the forward facing sonar, whether it's, it's bait selection, whether it's getting your tackle ready, whether it's shopping mm -hmm. online, all of those things all go into that, that moment. Right. Absolutely. And then, and then you have a guy like John Cox, who went to Walmart last night, bought a couple bags of worms and a couple hooks. Yeah, right, and and don't don't let me like I I don't want to. But it's that I, natural I fisherman, it right? Sound like like I'm saying anything negative towards John because he no 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 no, 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 no. But he's just he's just so natural at his craft. Right, like, right. He's just like it. It just seems to come to him. Like he doesn't need to him. You know? Thirty hours of practice leading up to a tournament. 
He just he figures it out the day of the tournament. Yeah, he, he goes out there and just figures it out. He's and doing, that's why he, that and, and my point to all this, and I, I didn't I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, my you're point good. is that's why he's so good. It's because he doesn't care what he called in practice or he does, but he's not I guess what I'm saying, he's not putting all his eggs in that basket. He knows that basket's already gonna fall through before he ever picks it up. Yep. Like he, he's already banking on that not working. He knows I'm just gonna go fishing and and use my uh, past experiences and, and what I know. Uh, and, he, and another uh, thing that I really, you know, attribute to, to John and something that I'm really trying to work on is, is his simplicity. Like, he doesn't overcomplicate things. Like, all my fishing buddies and, every, you know, all the guys that are listening to this now, they're all cackling because they know how analytical I am and, like, how picky. Like, I'll spend – man, I'll spend 10 minutes – I, I spend way too much time rigging stuff. I want it. It's got to be right. And that's all part of like confidence in my mm-hmm. head. Like it's, as long as I know that it's right, even if it's not, it's, I'm still going to fish it better. I'm going to do it better. Um, just because I'm confident in it. But, uh, you know, John's simplicity to everything is, uh, it's really astounding how, uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean, we've always been able to take a crankbait and a, you know, uh, some a chatterbait or spinnerbait, you know, and, and some sort of soft plastic and, and catch them about anywhere. But, like, that's a way harder to do now than what, what he makes it look like. Yet, he still rolls around the country uh, haphazardly, not knowing half where he's going and, and catches them everywhere he's, where he's at. So, uh, John's a great dude. And I, I hated, you know, there was a, a time this year that I was I was looking at fishing the MPFLs and um, – I was really looking forward to getting over there with John and hate that he's not going to fish the invitationals this year. Um, he's, he's a super fun guy to be around and, and um, man, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, I think we've got some stuff in the works. I, I'm trying to, I, so another thing I'm, uh, you know, working to get a YouTube channel and kind of get my social media stuff up and going. And, and uh, I'm, I'm working on some stuff on the YouTube side. Hopefully John and I can, can get our schedules uh, combined. I, I'd love for, uh, us to almost do like a an MLF style, you know, half day with scope and and half day without, you know, something like that, and, and uh, have some fun with it. Uh, that'd be that'd be interesting. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, we're we're trying to work something out for for next year, but uh, or or later on this year rather. Yeah. Um. So announcement real quick. Uh, we will be doing a twenty five dollar Baitworks gift card giveaway here shortly, and there's some new faces on here. The way that works is. I will make a somebody will make a reference to a Sasquatch. And when you hear that word, guess a number between one and 200. Whoever guesses the number that Jake gave us, I got it written down right here. They're going to win that $25 Baitworks gift card. So I want to, I want to kind of throw something at you. Um, it's kind of been a hot topic. We talked a lot about a, a lot about live scope, but from the back of the boat as a co angler, you know, it's difficult to fish behind somebody that is really locked in on, on the live scope. Um, it's not impossible to catch fish behind somebody, but it is a little bit more difficult. So what are some of the tips that you would recommend to a co-angler that's out there and, and the guy in the front of the boat or girl in the front of the boat is really using the live scope to their advantage? What are, what are some, some tips and stuff that you've seen? You know, you fish a lot of tournaments with somebody in the back of the boat. What are some things that you've seen that, that have made the guy in the back successful? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, Monty uh, McWilliams and I have, have been fishing tournaments for, uh, you know, quite a few years now. And and uh, really, we kind of got together about the time, maybe just before Live Scope, um, you know, kind of is what it is now. And, and so Monty and I have gone through this process together of, of uh, tr- us trying to figure out it, from a team aspect, how can we be the most efficient? You know, how can I do what, what I need to do up here and, and, and you be able to, to uh, do what he needs to do in, in the back and us, oh, you know, both be able to, to function and, and, and be able to do it. And, you know, <clears throat> um, there, there's never any one answer to it, uh, of course, like anything else in, in, in fishing, unfortunately. But, and, and honestly, what I want to say goes totally, totally against what he does. But I, I encourage you to, to to try to, you know, really cater more to those moving baits. The, the one thing with the live scope uh, is that now that we can see, uh, oftentimes, and, and you saw this uh, that day, like oftentimes we're not even fishing until we see what we're looking for. So it means we're, we're moving a lot faster. We're not creeping around like we, we used to. And so 
it's a lot harder to drag baits. Um, you know, a lot of my co-anglers are, are really wanting to, you know, to drag a shaky head and, and a Nico rig and, um, you know, your slower techniques. And those are all great ways to get bites. Um, but it's oftentimes hard when I'm moving at two miles an hour. Mm -hmm. It just, your bait's never, it's not really doing what it needs to do. And so um, a couple of the baits that, that we've kind of leaned on, I'll be honest with you, money throws, um, a Magnum uh, Ned rig, probably 80% of the time. And we've won, like, I'd have to go back and figure it out, but roughly say a dozen big bass uh, awards in various tournaments. And I've only won like two of them. He's caught all of them and all but one of those has come on that big net. So it's like, it's funny because everybody talks about a net being a kind of a, a, you know, a limit filler yet. He's always catching them. Well, for instance, Carl Perkins uh, this year on the South end of Kentucky Lake, he weighed in four of the six, four, yeah, four of the six, I mean, excuse me, four of the, of the 10, um, and again, I'm live scoping. I'm looking at every one of them before I cast to it. So there are still ways. I feel like a lot of co-anglers are really bummed out and, and um, just feel like, like like they don't have a shot. And that's it's really not the case. It's just a, it's a different uh, mindset. A couple of the baits that I uh, would always have tied on, uh, one is a, a wobble head, um, you know, or a biffle hardhead style. Uh, again, it's a great bait to still make bottom contact with, yet you're, you're constantly reeling. So you're, you're, you're never, uh, you know, off the bottom and kind of out of, um, you know, the strike zone. Um, another bait that, that uh, you can't ever go wrong with is uh, some little swim bait. I, we caught a ton of them on it, whether it be Monty or myself actually live scoping. Um, you know, with live scope, one thing that we've learned is, is that we don't necessarily need the biggest, gaudiest bait. Sometimes it does take that, but oftentimes to get these fish to bite, because I can now see him and present my bait exactly the way I know he wants it to be presented, it doesn't have to be this ginormous meal to make it worth him. Like if if I can make that thing scoot right across his noggin and, and he doesn't have to work too hard, he'll come up and eat a little two and you know, two point eight or, or three point three swimmer um you know just as good as as uh you know a mag spoon or something like that you know off live scope it's because we're actually presenting our bait to that fish as opposed to kind of haphazardly hoping we can run into it so um you know that's a a big part of it for sure but uh that little swimmer man you can cover uh, so much water with that whether you know, you're casting it out and, and keeping it in the, say, the top third of the water column or, or letting it sink all the way to the bottom. It's, it's something that you can fish anywhere, any time of the year. Um, and then I, another bait that we we throw, again, both myself and money, um, live scoping or non, is a big spinner bait. I think that's something that a lot of guys have, have gotten away from, um, you know, in the last 10 years with all the the swim bait craze, you know, that's, that's really kind of taken over a lot of the offshore fish. haven't seen a big spinner bait uh, anymore. And, and that's something that we've really, um, you know, utilized here in the last year or so to, to catch a lot of those, you know, better than average fish. Yeah. Well, um, one more, I'll add one more little bit to that. Um, so Stephanie was saying, maybe try to give the co-angler at least one fish. And so me as a co-angler, and, and we had this conversation, um, you know, throughout the day, like you said, this is how you're making your living. Um, and that one fish, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It would have been nice, you know, to uh, all the, I one, you to catch one, one of the, one of the hardest things to do, is to watch somebody in the front of the boat cull through two or three limits and you don't have one in the boat. That's hard. Right. It's hard. And it's happened to me. Well, it's happened one or two times. It doesn't happen that often. Thank God. But you're just wanting one of them two and three quarter pounders to put in your side. Just one bite. But, but that if you set up and let, and, and you, you gave me a few casts, you know, you gave me a few casts. Uh -huh. It didn't work. It didn't pay off, but you still did. But if you set up your co-angler, say you've got a decent limit, and uh, he makes that cast and he catches that six and a half pounder and you lose the tournament by two pounds and your small fish is two and three quarter. 
Well, there's no doubt that that fish costs you the tournament. Now, the chances that it happened may not be as strong, but it but it could happen. I've heard the stories. You know, I a have quick, heard the stories. A quick story. I almost let that happen this year in the Toyota tournament um, uh, here on Kentucky Lake. Uh, had a pretty decent – it was on the last day. Uh, had a fairly decent bag, like, I don't know, 17 and a half, 18 pounds. And, man, I was calling – or, excuse me, I was, uh, you know, running through just keeper size uh, – just about as fast as I could catch them, but I couldn't get him to catch. Like they just wouldn't eat. I had to put my bait exactly right on them. Those fish were, were locked down spawning and, and you just had a little bitty tiny hole to, um, you know, that they would get fired up in. And anyway, I said, all right, buddy, he was getting really upset and, 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 you know, not upset, but frustrated. And rightfully so I could understand. I mean, I wasn't even like second guessing and just chunking them over my shoulder and re-rigging and getting back out there. Uh, So I told him, I said, all right, I'd caught three on three consecutive casts uh, on this particular brush pile. And it was kind of cool. It was like when I pulled up, I saw one or two. But it was like as soon as I would pluck one off, by the time I'd get re-rigged and get back up, there'd be another one sitting there. I did it a couple of times in a row, but they were all just barely cookie-cutter keepers. So I said, all right, bud. His name's uh, Scott. Uh, Scott something. Anyway, I told him, I said, Scott, throw – I'm going to line you up. You throw uh, right in behind where my bait lands, and, and I'm just going to reel mine in and let you fish it. And sure enough, he didn't throw in there and catch a three and a half, three and three quarter, and I weighed in like a two and three quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, oh, this, I, you know, can't do that again. However, with that being said, I have. I mean, I, the the uh, Pickwick tournament, the, the super tournament there, was in a little better situation. Um, you know, I – I pretty well knew I had won that tournament by like eight thirty nine o'clock on the last morning. And so I was <laughs> yeah. able to spend like the last six hours trying to, you know, to catch my coast and fish. And we were, we, he caught a nice little bag and, uh, and was able to win. So it was a lot of fun. I, I, I want to help. I really do. And, and I hope that you know that, you know, throughout that day, like I was, I always had you in mind and I'm not saying that everyone does, but I always had you in mind and trying to keep you, um, you know, in the areas and, and, and not front end you and not keep you from where you needed to be because something that a lot of the boaters need to understand and, and this is the way that I always look at it, like I want you to catch them because if, uh, if you're catching them, again, I'm learning. Like if you're catching them, then that means first and foremost, I'm going right by them. I had first opportunity in theory at them. So whatever I'm doing – they're not liking, or they would have, I would have caught at least a few. Right. Them. So like, again, it goes back to that learning without success, so to speak. Um, like I'm learning from your success. Uh, so I want you to catch them. If, if you do, then that tells me, man, he's throwing way up on top of the flat, or maybe he's throwing way down in the bottom of the river channel. Uh, you know, whatever the, the circumstances may be, I've learned from that much faster than had you not been there. Um, and so I want y'all to learn, or excuse me, I want y'all to catch them because it's just helping me to learn what I need to do as well. Well, I'm, I'm going to say two things on that because I've been on that co-angler side more times than, than not, like where somebody's calling through and it happens, right? But it does. two things, I signed up as a co-angler. First and foremost, I signed up as a co-angler and I signed up to learn. I've gotten more out of that 105 to $150 entry fee <clears throat> In, in knowledge than I'll ever gain in a winning. Absolutely. Whether it's Absolutely. navigation on Kentucky Lake, whether it's running up a creek over on Smithland Pool, whether mm-hmm. it's fishing out, learning how to fish out on a ledge and sitting there watching a guy scan for four hours. Like, right. I learned way more than that and not catch a darn thing. Right, right, right. I've learned more than that. And the other thing that I'm going to say, because I'm going I'm to defend Jake on this one, and nothing against you, Gabe, but – you're putting food on the table with that money. That's supporting your wife and your boys. Right, right. Right. And, and, I'll, and I'll say um, back to what you talked about uh, as far as treat, treating it as a, uh, a learning, learning experience. experience. Yeah. It, it really was. Um, it, you know, the, the things that I learned, I try to learn something every time I go fishing. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. hundred percent. Especially when I fish with somebody that I don't know because everybody does uh-huh. something different. So – the things that I picked up um, just from the day we fished was, like I, like I mentioned earlier, hitting a bunch, a bunch of spots, being focused, um, not wasting any time. Um, 
seeing, seeing what you need to see. And if it's not there, moving on, I, I, I noticed another thing that I noticed was that you all in those tough situations, um, you learn mental discipline because you want, I, I never really spun out that day. There's a couple of times where um, I thought, well, you know, it, it's not looking, it's not looking likely that I'm going to um, throw my bait in front of a fish, but I, I do need to still focus because I'm learning something here. Um, but you, you learn mental toughness when you're put into those mental situations. And then mm -hmm. the technique that were, that you were using was a technique that I'd heard about, but I'd never actually witnessed it in motion and, and mm -hmm. see and saw it go down. So I learned all those things. So as a whole, um, and and you were great to fish with, man. We had a, we had a really fun oh, day. Oh man, I had, I had a blast. It was, it was a good day. I felt like I'd known you forever, and we had fun from the yeah. the night before on the phone till the till the end. And I, you know, I consider I made a friend. So yep, you can't absolutely. you can't um you can't discredit just because you didn't catch um uh, uh, actually weigh in a fish as uh, the whole tournament being a total loss because it was not. And I had I did have a shot. You know, you I did. I kept you my did. head down, I kept my bait wet, yep. and uh, you uh. There was two brush piles and you you finagled around the one, couldn't get them to bite, and you slid up to the other one. And I made a little cast there. But yep. like you said, I was throwing that shaky head a lot. And I wasn't the way we were fishing, I wasn't getting a lot of time to soak it most of the time. I, there was there was a couple times, but even on those times, I was just kind of thrown out in the middle of nowhere. But, right, right. Yeah. It's just it's so hard with a shaky head and, and kind of what what I'm doing. Um, yes. You know, it's it, and it's one thing for me to throw that shaky head. Like I, that's what's crazy is is as a boater, I can throw that shaky head and still cover a ton of water because I can stop and make that cast and present that bait exactly to the fish. If it doesn't bite, wind it in, and I'm back two and a half miles an hour going to the next one. However. Right. On your end, it's constantly swimming around, you know, uh, back behind the motor. And it's just, it's hard to keep your bait in the zone. One thing that, that I've learned from Monty, um, uh, and, and one thing that he's done to, to help him is he's really upsized everything. You know, I emphasize, like, he's not throwing a little Ned, you know, a little bitty two or three inch worm on there. He's throwing a fairly good sized worm, but he's throwing a, like a fifth ounce. Um, so it's fairly heavy and it gets to the bottom pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's wind or, or me on a trolling motor, like he can kind of open the bail and just kind of let things free fall and, and maybe drift back if I'm headed to another pile or, or headed to the next bar, like I've seen him open the bail and, and let it ride back there for 50 yards. And when I get to my next spot and stop, then he closes his bail and starts fishing and he's on the, the second bar back or whatever, you know, I've seen him catch <laughs> some do that, yeah. but. You're in Kentucky but, uh, and he's in Tennessee. But it, upsizing that weight will help you as a co-angler. Again, it, the, the objective is just to get to the bottom mm -hmm. as fast as you can. And, and something else that, um, yeah, because I'm sure you know, like I'm not an extremely patient guy. Like they, I am. But when it comes to fishing, like they better buy it pretty quick. And if I'm dragging something, boy, they better buy it real fast or I'm, I'm going to have to do something else. And, and so, uh, Something else that, that I've learned from Monty and, and that heavier head is is like a lot of times now with with a, a Ned rig in particular or any of those kind of, you know, uh, Nico rigs or, or uh, light Texas rigs, shaky heads, is I'll actually shake it and drag it your traditional way for, say, um, 10 or 15 feet. And then I'll just take off and wind it, maybe four or five cranks and just open my bail and let it go back to the bottom. Can't tell you how many bites I actually get uh, where it shoots off the bottom, and when it makes contact again, they'll eat it. And I think what they're doing is whether they uh, were already interested or curious following it, and all of a sudden when it takes off, you know, it's almost like a reaction strike, or whether they actually caught wind of, you know, uh, saw it for the first time when it rocketed off the bottom uh, and then followed it down and, and ate it. But I, I have caught a ton doing that this year. And it's something that as a co-angler, it allows you to still be fishing a, a bottom bait, uh, but you're, you're able to do it in cover water, you know, and I may drag it two or three feet and then I'll reel it four or five cranks and let it go back to the bottom and hop it once or twice and drag it two or three feet. And I'm just kind of mixing it up and, and trying to stay in contact with the bottom, but, but still moving uh, and, and covering some ground. So Something you can do with a jig as well. Um, you know, any bottom, heavier bottom moving bait, you can get away with it. 
Let's let's pull that question up there from Jay. I don't know if Jay's still on here, but um, he had a question. He says, Jake, as you become a very recognized angler, does pressure and other anglers play a factor in your decisions? He says he has an upcoming tournament that in a fishery that's going to fish really small. Uh, yes, absolutely. I am not one to, to, I'm not good at fishing around a lot of people. It, it doesn't really, it doesn't bother me. Like what's weird about it. it, it most people it upsets them when they, they see other people catching them. To me, that just gives me confidence. Like I, I know they're biting. I just have to figure out whatever it is. But, but to me, like, I, I don't know, I guess I'm so like non-confrontational and, um, I don't know, kind of kind hearted. Like I don't want to upset anybody. And it makes me feel uncomfortable. Like instead of trying to concentrate on what my bait's doing, if I'm fishing around somebody, now I'm sitting here second guessing, like, am I getting, am I cutting him off? Like, am I, does he think I'm going to cut him off? You know, (laughs) I'm always weighing those options in my head. Whereas I would, I would rather just uh, get away from it and avoid it, you know, uh, altogether. But with that being said, there's, there's times and situations where you can't do that. You know, it's, it's uh, some of these, tournaments that uh that we used to fish would have them on these you know smaller 500 uh to 1200 acre lakes and and i don't care what you're going to do there you're going to be fishing around some guys so it's just part of um you know it is some mental fortitude to kind of put your head down and and i should get over that like i promise you that guy over there is not worried if he's cutting me off like I, you know but it's just kind of my nature and, and it's something that i've always my integrity and, and kind of how I hold myself is, is always of the utmost and, and um, something that I'm going to put, you know, ahead of everything else. So it'll um, take you a lot farther. I promise. Do I know? It'll take you a lot farther than cutting somebody off. It'll yeah, get well, you a lot right, farther in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but I will say, um, you know, as far as fishing in a crowd and, and something that I've learned uh, and I know I'm, I'm, probably getting a a little repetitious here but with live scope and and fishing in a crowd is just because that fellow went through there or gal doesn't really mean a whole whole lot like it's amazing how close you can be to a bass like your bait be to a bass and if it's not presented in the right manner he'll almost act like it was never even there you know i mean it's it's uh they can there's there's certainly times when you know when boats uh and other anglers can influence a fish in a negative way but so many times they go right in behind people and and catch them and they act like they've never seen a bait before you know so i don't don't let the 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 fact that you know four or five boats uh ten boats have already been down this channel swing bank uh if that's one of the only channel swing banks in that that lake or even in that bay chances are there's probably a few fish still down it so don't don't let the you know uh, the other boats get in your way. Just go fishing, and I, I try to do that. I just it's it, I I make that sound easier than what it is. It's it's I still get wigged out, um, but it's really especially with live scope. You can go in behind guys, and so often these fish are relating offshore. You know, out deeper, they're relating a lot higher in the water column than what we've ever thought. Uh, and a lot of times when when the fishing got really difficult it's it's because we're fishing under them so like if if i'm going to fish for a bass i would uh and and i'm not going to present it correctly i would rather be 10 feet above that bass as i would be 10 inches under him you've got a much better chance of him coming up 10 feet than you do him going down any uh now with that being said i've caught a zillion of them that follow my jig all the way down to the bottom and we'll eat it. I'm not saying that you can't, but he saw that jig when it was up above him and he chose and decided to, to follow it down. You never want to be under these fish uh, or, or throw with their tail. Um, but the, the uh, spookiness and kind of the fickleness of these fish allows a lot of people to fish right through them and, and they're not going to bother them. So I got a question right down here. How long, I mean, we, we've learned tonight that you're very, very patient. You like to spend a lot of time on, on one fish. How long do you spend on one fish? It all depends on the size of that fish uh, and, and how aggressive kind of what it's telling me. So when, when I see a fish on live scope, we've always heard the, uh, you know, the really good sight fishermen talking about being able to read a fish and just by looking at it and kind of watching it for a few seconds, being able to, to have a pretty good understanding of what it likes and, excuse me, maybe what it doesn't. 
that's very much the same thing that I'm doing with live scope. Um, okay. Now, sometimes it can be uh, a little more guesswork there, but but oftentimes I can tell you, uh, Gabe can remember, like I would tell you, uh-oh, this one's going to bite. Like I've seen 10 in the last few minutes, but that one's right. the one we've been waiting on. And it's just a position, kind of how they're acting, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But all of those factors play into to how long that I'll spend on a fish. One thing that I'll tell you, is that oftentimes, well, without a shadow of a doubt, your absolute best shot at catching that bass and tricking that fish is the very, very first time that he ever saw your bait. Uh, not to say you, you can't catch him on after that, but that's absolutely your best opportunity. What I have come to find out is that if they don't bite after, you know, maybe one or two uh, technique changes or, um, you know, two or three different offerings and, and, you know, maybe a couple of different angles at the fish, that fish probably isn't going to bite no matter what you do and, and uh, or at least bite at that given moment. Now, I can think on several different occasions this year that I, and I don't think that you and I did it that first day, um, but I can count on almost every tournament, really. I had a fish that I couldn't get to bite, but I knew I needed that fish and I would come back sometimes even three or four times during the day. But I, each time I would spend less and less time there. Like, again, I'm more or less uh, trying to catch him on that first cast. And then after that, my confidence, every cast after that is kind of going down, make a handful and, and move on, come back to him in a little while. But I really don't want to spend a, a ton of time on one if I don't have to. Um, just again, uh, most of the time you're going to catch him on that first go around. And, and if you don't, just come back. I mean, most of the time, even if that fish isn't related around, uh, you know, a, a piece of cover, uh, oftentimes they're living in a little zone out there. And if they're free floating out there, you know, say five feet over 15, it, he's probably going to stay in that same general area. I mean, it's uh, not always, but oftentimes I've come back even in open water and feel like I've refound the same fish as long as I didn't spook him, you know, as long as he just decided not to bite. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's a question. What are, what are some, what are some things that you're seeing fish do? Uh, and maybe, maybe you're not, but now like say within, I don't know, 2023 or the, the later half of 2023 with live scope mm -hmm. that you weren't seeing them do when live scope first came out, are you seeing fish do anything different? Like what, and what I mean is, is there, I mean, I, I've asked this question to a couple of people. We had, we had Sukup on John Sukup on last, last week. And I proposed, you know, I was talking about how I see fish, you know, what I assume they're feeling the transducer beam coming on them and they're, and they're dropping down low in the water column. And he was saying that that's most likely just them, feeling your boat or seeing seeing your boat or they're, seeing they're reacting to the presence yeah, of see, you. seeing that prop that shiny prop a little you know a little flash or a gleam because he's had he's been using that technology for four or five years and he said yeah. it's been going on since he very started using it yeah the been first, going on some of the first fish he saw would do that would, would, right 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 and coat, I, coat. I agree a thousand percent uh behind that you know stand behind that statement i've always seen them do that i mean it's it's just in their nature i mean we we are a predator uh and they may not know they don't know what we are what that big shadow is but they know it's not good i mean that's not normal that's not supposed mm -hmm. to be happening and so I, I don't know that it has i hear that a lot and i get that question a lot uh, about, you know, the transducer pinging. And, and, you know, I even hear a lot of guys, I think it's Jason Christie maybe, that will pan over there, get his bait lined up on the fish, and it just before the bait comes, you know, over the fish, he'll turn his transducer away so that that fish doesn't feel that pressure. I, I'm not entirely sold on that. Um, I just don't think that we've been able, ever been able to see those fish spook away like that. You know, I, I don't think that it's – they're doing it more now because we're putting more – pressure on them with the transducer I, I do think that um there's no doubt live scope is changing uh, and we all knew that it would it's changing how we pressure these fish and and how much pressure we're actually putting on them so we've always known at least to some degree i had no earthly idea that like the vast majority of the fish did this but 
we've always known that there was a population of fish that didn't necessarily live around anything or, or relate to anything. They're somewhat pelagic, so to speak. Uh, maybe not all the time, but at least during parts of the day or, or you know, times of the year, they become very nomadic and, or, or pelagic and um, get off the bottom and roam around. Uh, with live scope, you realize just how often and just how many are out there doing that. So like prior to us, you know, prior to us really being able to efficiently target that one, a bass in theory could go out there, say uh, the, the Channel Swing Bank in, in Panther Bay right across the river here, uh, that on that north bank, that thing gets fished 10 times a day on a bad weather day when nobody's fishing. Um, th- there's always fish up and down that. But before live scope, they were used to be able to go out of the middle of that creek channel and roam around again very high in the water column but over deep water and as long as they were out there they virtually never saw a bait i mean nobody's people are fishing out there but they're not fishing five feet deep over 25. Um, you're fishing so the wrong do, of the boat around them right 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 i do feel like that the fish are getting more um leery they're 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 getting to some degree on certain bodies of water i feel like they are getting more fickle some smaller bodies of water where everything is just like really consolidated they can't get away from it you know some of these smaller impoundments like um uh, these little watershed lakes and you know 500 uh acre and smaller lakes like you can tell now versus say three or four years ago just how much more skittish. So like I, I generally on live scope will keep my uh, forward range on a hundred feet. Uh, and there's a lake here pretty close to the house that gets a lot of pressure. And it used to have a lot of great big ones in it. It's getting so much pressure now that literally as they come into the screen, they turn and go back out of the screen. I mean, you, you like, you can't even really get a bait to them. Um, and, and I, again, I don't know that that's the transducer. I really just think, before they could go out in the middle of this little uh, impoundment and get away from everybody. And yeah. now we're all out there chasing them around. They never get a break from that. So I, I do, again, I, I'm not saying that that's a negative thing. I just feel like it, it is something that we're going to have to take into consideration and, and we're eventually going to change, you know, anything that um, uh, has a negative outcome, like I- any uh, animal, you know, that has some negative outcome with something is only going to have that outcome so many times before they say, all right, I give up, I'm done, I'm going to do something else, you know, and, and that's, um, it's too early to tell, but I do feel like right now we're kind of on the cusp of kind of the leading edge of kind of these open water. It's, you're almost crappy fishing. Uh, and Gabe and I weren't in that particular tournament. They were more related to the bottom and, and cover. Uh, but a lot of the tournaments uh, are being won. And, and several of them that I won last year, completely open water. Those fish are not around anything. And and that's something that we've never really been able to target before. And, and so I, I guess it, to wrap that up, like, you know, long story short, I, I think this is the happening thing now. And this is going to be for a little while. But you watch. It's, these things are smart enough. When this technology gets even better than what it is now, and we all get better than what we are now, they'll they'll figure out somewhere else to go. I don't know where it'll be. It may be buried up in the mud somewhere, but um, I feel like you know a bass is, along with any other animal, is only going to take so much of that before they either get so fickle where they won't bite, or or they're just going to change altogether and kind of do something. Them suck, you know, them the suckers get tight to the bottom, you know. They get a lot tight. That's one, that's a whole one. lot harder to see that way. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're really. You got to really be. You got to look for any little, just a little nub sticking up on the bottom, yep. and just watch it. And it might move every once in a while. Um, every once in a while. Yep. What do you think? Where do you think electronics and stuff are going? I mean, one thing that you have that not a lot of people had, at least last year, was the crappie breaks. You know, on your mm-hmm. on your power poles. And that was. Yep. Uh, there was a guy over here locally that had some of those that I saw a couple of months before I fished with you. And that's the first time I'd actually seen that, but I'd never actually fished in the boat with somebody. Right. And that, if you're really into forward facing sonar, that, that was a super, super handy tool. I got to see it. I got to see it in action and it made total sense to me why somebody would want to have that because just, just for the simple fact that you can, 
you can stop not below water over the cover that you're fishing. You can correct you can stop correct. dead. You don't have to spin your trolling motor around to stop and lose your image. You know, exactly. you, can keep your, you can keep that transducer on whatever piece of cover you're fishing. Um, correct. So there's there's that that's kind of a new thing that's happening. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more people that have got their boats rigged with that this year. But what Absolutely. are some of the other things you think might happen? Like how far how far do you think they can take electronics? I mean, what what do you see like in the next two, three, four, five years? Just it, it's freestyle, scary. you know? Yeah, it, it's scary to know uh, you know where we might be. With that being said, it's also really exciting. I mean. Again, what what keeps me um, so passionate and, and, and so excited every day is that I know there's opportunity there to learn something and, and, and bring something new to the table that I didn't even know existed yesterday. You know, that that is is uh, uh, to me is, is what's most exciting about it. And, and so, yeah, to be able to, um, you know, to do that, it's, um, you know, with with the electronics where they're going I, man who knows the sky is the limit um the just like these uh you know performance fishing breaks man the the efficiency rate at which that has put me is unbelievable and i will tell you hands down without a question and i wouldn't just say this two tournaments last year not that one uh not the one that you were with me but two tournaments in particular, there is 100% no way that I would have won that tournament. I'm sure I'd have caught some, but no way that I could have fished with the, you know, at the efficiency rate as many places as well as I was able to fish them in that kind of wind. Um, and I'll be honest, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, uh, you know, kind of coined as a live scoping deal, but we've all gone down the bank again we take that bush uh you know analogy like you want to get to that bush as fast as possible but we can all only get there so fast until we start backwashing or uh you know causing creating a big scene and and uh you know spooking what's around now i can zip even you know shallow visible cover that i'm not scoping i can run at you know two and a half miles an hour get exactly to my lineup where i'm i can make a little cast into that v in a in a lay down um once i get my bait through there i'm back on the troll motor and headed to the next one like it's just so much faster and more efficient and again it all revolves back around uh, the guy that wins generally the guy that keeps his bait in the strike zone longer and, and that has without question probably done more for me than anything else um just as far as an, an efficiency rate and day in day out being able to do what you need to do you know it's always kind of the deal it's like well the wind's blowing out of the southwest we can't can't fish this spot and that spot we, you know it's, we're gonna have to make something happen somewhere else and there, there just really isn't a lot of that these breaks really uh allow you to have complete control uh of the entire boat you know we've always had control of the front of the boat but you never really had control of of, of the entire thing the back end just kind of swung around as it did and uh so it, it has and i i'll i'll make a, a pretty um you know tall claim but I, I i say that i really don't feel like it I, I see these breaks being just like power poles were in the early 2000s you know when they first came out it was you never heard of them to all of a sudden now there's two on you know uh every boat uh, well, it's like spot, I, I really it's like spot like lock it's on steroids now right like do it now it's like spot lock on steroids Hundred percent. Now you can control the front and the back of the boat, like you and said. And the back of the boat. And I've even, and I probably shouldn't let the cat out of the bag on this, but I'm wanting spot lock on my on my brakes. I've been talking with Danny there <clears throat> in performance and and trying to work out something. Of course, there's a lot of moving parts with that, but but how cool would it be to have spot lock and and still be able to to operate your transducer on the front? Like well. The, the sky's the limit as far as this technology and, and where it's headed and where it's going to take us. The To me, the most important part, and not just about electronics, but just fishing and the industry as a whole, is I, I really, I hope that we can stay kind of in a positive frame of mind and kind of keep things moving in a good direction. And And what I mean by that is, and I don't mean anything negative towards this um, with anyone. It's the it's the nature of the beast. But kind of the way things have 
um, evolved in the last, really the last year or so, um, is we see so much negative. Like there's, you know, all the controversy is what gets talked about and the kind of the, maybe the not so nice parts of- You're, you're, na you you're know, navigating this, and, this very nicely. And that's what gets blown up and that's what everybody wants to talk about because it's interesting and it's uh, gossip and, and, you know, whatever it may be. But I, I hope that regardless of where these electronics go, uh, you know, in the future, I hope that we can utilize it in a, in a positive frame of mind. And, and, you know, there's, if there's anything that I hate that's come from live scope, it's so much negative. It's so much, uh, well, that's just cheating and that's not what it needs to be. And I'm too old for that. I can't do that. It, if that's what you think you're selling yourself short, I know a ton of guys that are, 50 and up that do it just as good as as any 30 year old it all it is is time like you're you're cheating yourself selling yourself short by saying well i'm just too old for that i can't do it no you just haven't dedicated enough time to, yep. to go do it i mean it's it's not really that hard like in my opinion it's harder for me to teach someone how to operate and and understand side imaging and utilize it you know be able to scan down a ledge appropriately as opposed to live scope once i show them what two or three bass look like and what two or three uh you know uh trash fish so to speak carp gar various species it's pretty quick it's pretty easy to get an understanding really the hardest part about it is just being able to learn and i shouldn't say the hardest part the most time consuming part is being able to get your bait to where you want it to be and control the boat and, and kind of have all of those moving parts work in unison together. Uh, it's really what's more difficult than, than anything. Finding the bass is really not that hard. Life scope's easier than skipping a jig, I promise you that. Absolutely. I, how many guys are really good at skipping a jig? What did it, what did it take? Practice, time? Practice. They went and, sk and skipped a jig for a long time. But nobody wants to practice looking at a screen for a long well, time. Well, we've had this conversation. It's it's hard to... It's hard not to fish. Yeah, yeah I, I was using the word unlearn your techniques, but it's not really unlearning. It's it's hard to... It's learning in a new yes. way. It's it's learn. I know exactly what you it's mean. Getting con it's getting confidence, enough confidence in uh, going out there and looking around that you do it for four or five hours and, and you're... It, right. it's, you've had a habit over 20, 30 years of fishing, of fishing a certain way. And this is a, this is a different, you're, you're doing similar things. You may be using similar baits and you're casting in similar cover that you've always been doing, but it's just Correct. a different, it, it, a different it's approach. Different. And, Correct. and you, and you, you got to break say, that habit. Uh, excuse me. One um, really hard thing to overcome in the beginning Something that, that does take a minute is is trying to figure out when to scope and when to not scope. But I can guarantee you, uh, or excuse me, when to fish and, and, and when to scope. But the one thing I can guarantee is that you can't do both. Like, you're not going to fish good and you're not going to scope good if you try to, you know, <laughs> sling, I'm just going to sling a crankbait down this bank while I pan, you know, out here in the creek channel. You're going to have that hung up in every tree limb that yeah. is remotely close to the shoreline. That's true. That's you're going to miss point. every one, you know, not every one. You're going to miss a lot of the ones that you're, that you're, you know, coming by. And it's just, it's hard to do both well, you know, efficiently. And, um, and so that's why you see, you know, I, I get a ton of questions and, and I see a lot of kind of, I don't want to say rude comments, but like, you know, negative comments about, well, all they do is just sit up there and, you know, it's like you can't do both. I, we're moving. It's it's hard to realize, like, if you're watching live, it's hard to realize how fast we're moving around. But, I mean, we're zipping, like, two to three and a half miles an hour. Try fishing anything at three miles an hour. Like, it, you just can't. It doesn't work. You troll, troll a plug for a walleye or something, but. Well, um, well okay, hold on. Let, let's let's put it into a live perspective. We're, we're watching fish catches on TV. And let's say Gabe was your cameraman on Kentucky Lake this past fall. You caught three limits Which of I fish. Which I basically was. Yeah. yeah. You caught three limits of fish, right? Let's just uh -huh. say. Uh -huh. Denny Breyer went down to that, that same stretch 25, 30 years ago flipping a jig, and he caught three bass. Right. And Correct. he never said a dang word to the camera. Right. Because he was exactly. flipping a jig down he's, the Exactly. Bank. He's going to stick it in a hole about that big. 
But now, because we have live, we have YouTube channels, we have all these other outlets to view someone fishing, now live scope is the problem. No, we just have more. Now we're watching eight, nine, ten hours of somebody fishing the back of their jersey where we, we had an hour special 20 years ago on TNN that or TNT that yeah. you got the highlights of that. You consolidated three days into really it was a 30 minute show, but you had 15 minutes worth of commercials. So I mean you're well, not you getting a, any fishing time. And a hundred guys. You took a hundred right. guys, took thirty minutes of fishing in that in that section, and then 10 minutes away in or whatever it was. Yep. We just have so much more access to everything today. Exactly. And it looks the whole negativity looks bad on it because that's what they're focused on. Well, that's what everybody's doing. Denny Brower right. was flipping a jig. 20 years ago, doing the same thing, but nobody watched eight hours of Denny Brower flipping a jig, catching right. five And, and look, hey, I, I agree. Like, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm one of the biggest fans, you know, of, of the sport. Like, I, I agree. It's a lot more fun when I watch uh, Stephen Browning, uh, you know, on the BPT. Like, he's going to go chunk that chatterbait around somewhere. And it is fun when everybody's out panning around doing their deal, and here you see, uh, you know, Stephen Browning running way up the river and, and chunking that, you know, that jackhammer. Like it, it is, it's, it is more enjoyable to, to see that. But at the same time, now that we know what we know, it's like, you can't go, you don't want to go back. I mean, yeah. do you want to, do you want to watch us, uh, catch and it take 15 pounds a day to, to win at Rayburn without live scope and, and not catch very many or, you know, and, and again, f traditionally fishing, so to speak, or do you want to watch somebody have a shot at catching, you know, 30 pounds a day? I mean, it's a legitimate, I don't know that it'll happen, but it could. Somebody's going to be around 30 pounds a day. Um, no doubt about it. Live scoping around. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it goes both ways, but I, I just, I, I wish that we would, um, man, this is a great spark. Like we've got so many, you know, good things going for us. And for us to all sit around and only talk about the two or three things that maybe aren't exactly perfect or exactly the way we would all like them to be. I, I don't know. I think we're, I think we're a little better than that. I just hope that we can, uh, you know, kind of keep the positivity and kind of keep things going in the right direction. Well, and somebody said it on a podcast earlier this week that, how small is our industry? We're, oh, we're, we're talking about a very, very minuscule half, half of small. a percent of it's fishermen small. that actually even give a crap about live scope. Right. Yeah, exactly we're in our own little world, and we're so hyper focused on ourselves that and we think it's huge, but it's not. We, it's right. Really small. Well, it, it, Jake, yeah. how, how'd you learn? Was it a cricket and a cork? How learn scope fishing cricket and a cork? Do what now? How did you learn fishing with a cricket and a cork? Man, I I started when like literally younger than I can remember. Yeah, um, I I wish I had. Uh, the re we're actually remodeling in the next room. There's some really cool pictures when I was a little bitty. I'm talking like I got to be three, and I'm already throwing a bait caster. Like look, like you can tell the, well, the way I'm holding it. I'm, I've been doing it a minute. You know what I mean? I I don't know. I always again, you know, was was in the back of somebody's boat every weekend. Uh, like he's so started, much stuff. Like he's my dad, we've got pictures yeah. of my dad in, in, in our uh, uh, old Ranger where he put the, like the little baby bassinet down there in the bottom. I had an umbrella over me <laughs> and the whole nine yards. I mean, changed my diaper in the back of the boat kind of deal. So you had a sunglass fan line before you could walk. Right, right. It's always been, you know, a, a part of me. Um, but honestly, it, you know, it was more the bass side that's always had me. I, I enjoy crappie fishing. I, I enjoy taking the boys bluegill fishing, and, and we do a little friends trip every year and have a big time um, at a little bluegill bash. But I, I don't know. It's something about a bass. Again, it's it's not and, – and even when I was a kid, it's always been this way. Like, it's not so much the, the act of catching it as it is just – figuring it out and, and understanding all that and kind of learning that process. It's always intrigued me since I was really small, like I, younger than what I should have been to, to kind of be into that at, at that level. But well, what um, I was getting out there was there's a heck of a lot more people out there that, that just go down and enjoy fishing. Absolutely. And Thank man, fishing. that's the greatest, yeah. that, that's the greatest thing about this sport is you, again, we can make it as complicated 
or as simplistic, you know, as a, a cork and a, and a cricket uh, yep. as you want to make it. Yeah. Anywhere in between. Brad's got a good question here. It's my buddy Brad. Um, yeah, and, and anybody out there, um, we're going to start winding this down. If you got any, if you got any questions, blow question. them up here and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We've got um, a handful coming up on a uh, kind of rapid fire. So here. Brad says, what is your opinion on why smallmouth have dominated Kentucky Lake the last few years? So here, here's my two cents on that. And by no means am I a biologist. This is uh, only coming from my uh, experiences and, and what I've seen in my lifetime. But for whatever reason, at least here, and you see this on other bodies of water too, but at least here on Kentucky Lake, for whatever reason, we seem to struggle or can't ever get a big largemouth population and a big smallmouth population at the same time. They never seem to really coincide. It's always kind of a teeter-totter. One's up and one's down. Uh, if you recall back in the, and, and a lot of the kind of the old timers uh, uh, will we'll remember this, you know, 97 through 2005 was some of the most incredible smallmouth fishing. If you were part of that, it's the most, and it may still be for the rest of my life, you know, the most incredible stuff that I've ever seen and, and witnessed prior to GPS and kind of the good old days. But, but if you remember, like the, the largemouth fishing wasn't maybe not as bad as it got this last little, you know, round, but it, in, in the late nineties, it got way down. The largemouth population, you know, was not doing well. And, and if you remember, about 2005, six, seven ish, right in there is when we started getting a ton of little largemouth. We could all go out here and catch 50 or 100 of them a day. Nice. Uh, but they'd all be 12, 14 inches long. We got a mouse uh, running around you know, in here. But again, as soon as we saw that, the very next year, you stopped seeing smallmouth. So it's, there's something to do with, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm sure they're competing over, uh, you know, uh, forage or, and saying that though, my goodness, there's millions of it out there. Like they can't eat, there's not enough bass to eat all that up. So I can't biologically tell you exactly why they can't like both be, you know, top end at the same, but, but we typically see this cyclical, uh, you know, this cycle of kind of ebb and flow of, of one kind of going downhill at the same time, the other one's kind of rebounding and coming back. So if we get a mouse, if a mouse, we got a mouse, so we're down here. We're, my, we're at my father-in-law's place here, which is right next door to where I live because I don't have good internet over there. And he's got he had a he had a few mice in here last about the this time about about the time last year, right? So we got mouse traps everywhere. Well, when I come down here this afternoon or this evening to set this up, there was one one got its head popped in the trap. It was sitting over there. I took him outside and got rid of him. We got about four or five traps over here. And we're hearing a couple running around here. So <laughs> JB's looking over there like there's a Sasquatch sitting in the room. He's getting all nervous like he's in the woods and a Sasquatch is going to come up behind him and grab him by the back uh, of the head or whatever. Well, it sounded like something was coming down the chimney. And I know Christmas is in the rearview mirror. So you would see Sasquatch come down with a Christmas hat on. That's right. Yeah, that's I'd be, right. I, the live stream would end very abruptly. If I turned around, <laughs> I saw Sasquatch there with a red, red hat and a little white bulb on the front. I fish, I cook says, uh, if you were financially limited, which would you choose, Live Scope or 360? I know which one I would choose, but I want to hear what Jake wants to choose. So to me, I, I get that. That's a great question, uh, and, and I get that a ton. My, my answer to that is, is really uh, it depends more on how you fish, not necessarily your price point or what you're comfortable spending. Uh, if you are an extremely shallow, you know, say seven feet of water or less, uh, I'm going to tell you to, to go with the 360. Uh, if you like some of that, um, you know, call it offshore, but to call it that, you know, seven to, to 50 feet, I'm going to go with a, with a live scope for forward facing. You got it. Okay. You know, land, of the, land between the lakes. Squatch does have a squatch a reputation for having like a dog man or sasquatch i'm sure you've lived in that area long enough to you've maybe heard some rumblings about that oh, That's kinda, oh, there's awesome. some there's some weird stuff that happens across the pond from where you live at there's some good stuff over there let me tell you yeah i had a buddy a buddy of mine jerry uh him and his wife were driving over there this is he used to he had a, he had a trailer at b springs for yeah 20 20 years so they'd get, be over there on a the weekend, and one night they were they were driving. I guess they, I don't know if they went across sixty eight or they went up across the dam or whatever. But they got over, 
they got over and, uh, and landed between the lakes over there, and they were driving around. It was kind of late at night, and they saw some kind of a. Uh, it was a big dog-looking creature, what kind of, kind of scampering across the road. They said it was, you know, it wasn't like a cow that big, but it was bigger than what you would think a dog would would be across the back. And it was just a weird looking animal. And it was kind of, they didn't get a super, super good look at it, but they got it. It, it was freaky enough to where he, he said, he'll never forget it. And him or his wife cannot positively identify it as something that you would normally see. So, you know, you, you, Gabe, you were asking me about a, a, a about a, a story. So I've got a, a hunting buddy of mine who his brother is probably 40, let's just say 45, mid 40s. Uh, when he was 18 or 19, fresh out of high school, uh, he went duck hunting by himself. And it, it's a big, long, drawn, it's been years since I've heard the story. But he got so spooked that still to this day, he's been duck hunting two or three times, but will not go in the woods by himself. I mean, it's, huh. it's he petrified of whatever in the world it was. We never got a good sighting. It was Long story to it, but nonetheless, I you were asking about that earlier. That is a, a funny story. I mean, a diehard duck hunter who more or less completely gave it up. Like the only way he'll go is if you know it's three or four guys and and well, everybody's got lights on and you know how it is. It's uh he saw something or heard something. He he had something spooking for sure. Yeah, mine's a, mine's a similar story. And I've told it on here a bunch, but yeah, mine's similar. Mine was waterfowl hunting by myself. Uh, I, my, mine was, I don't I don't I don't have any thoughts. You think yours was a cat? Probably, mine was right? a I, I think mine was a mountain lion that was following me. Oh, nothing scares me more. Uh, now I'd, I rather, can't, I'd are, almost rather try to duke it out with a great white as I would a mountain lion. Like they scare me to death. You don't even know they're around. No. Like well, I, we probably got them over there in El. But I'm sure we got one over there. You wouldn't know it if he didn't want you to. Well, I know we got them. I know for facts that we got them local. Local yeah. enough, at least. By the right. way, uh, Alex Butler is the winner. You guys can stop. Yeah, we do got a winner. Alex, uh, hit me up on uh, Facebook at Gabe Montgomery, Gabe Montgomery Fishing, or Ten Horse Monty, or on Instagram at Ten Horse Monty Six, um, and I will get you taken care of tomorrow for sure. Congratulations! But no, we were talking about before we went live. We were talking about waterfowl hunting. And you, you used to guide for waterfowl hunting, but mm -hmm. yeah, that was my uh, my encounter in the dark, just walking down the road, something walking next to me, and it was pacing me every time I stop. It stopped. I start uh -oh. walking. I could hear it walking, and all of a sudden, it let out a scream. And you know, you, you waterfowl hunted enough. You know this. Like I parked the truck and I left all my stuff down in the boat. Right, so, right. I'm not carrying a shotgun. It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm not carrying a shotgun down what the road. You, I don't need it. Right. What do you need? Yeah. yeah. So I'm walking down the road. You know, full full gear. Just I probably had a eighth quarter mile walk to the boat. Yeah. And it turned into a full on sprint. Sprint. Because <laughs> like, my, my first thought was cats don't swim that good. So, right. My question get, was did you sprint back towards the truck or towards the boat? Towards the boat. That's yeah. where the shotgun was at. <laughs> well, yeah, you got you to gotta walk back through that same block of woods, get to the That's truck. Right. I think I'd have gone to the. To the house. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking I would have been, I would have sat in the truck till the sun came up. Is what well, I would have done. I, let's put it this way: I dove in the boat, and it wasn't too long before that motor was running, and I was gone. <laughs> I so. tell you one, one quick. I know we we, we got to wrap this up, but it's not a Sasquatch story, but one of the most uh, terrified, startled, I guess, that I've ever been was walking into a deer woods, and um, it's a big field, but for some reason the farmer left a like a little dirt road that wasn't used very often so it had grown up in this kind of like knee high uh grass and man i was sneaking through there in the dark no lights on you know and and i jumped i guess the first and only wild covey of quail that i've ever jumped i have never in my life heard something like a ruckus like that coming out of that grass right all around my feet in the dark like that you almost I, put I, it was like I knew, you know, it took me a few minutes to figure out, but like I knew what it was, and it still took me a while to calm myself down. Mm -hmm. So I know when you when you get that feeling, it's hard to shake it for sure. Yeah, that that covey of quail or, or something something right here in the yeah. in the dark. That one. Yep. I tell you what, bow hunting when you get them first thing in the morning, and the birds are, you know, just starting to wake up in the morning, and one of them will hit you right in the chest. 
That one will about knock you out of tree stand when you're sitting down. I promise you that. <laughs> I've never had that happen. And you I've might have to clean your you might have boat. to clean your britches. Yeah, right. before you trade dude wipes with you. <laughs> That's right. Here, here's a question: uh, Does Jake ever hit Barkley, or does he strictly prefer the Kentucky Lake side of things? So I, I do enjoy fishing Barkley. I don't get over there as much as I would like. Again, it's uh, you know with it setting up more like a kind of a river you know system. Uh, I enjoy going sneaking over there and, and uh, you know, turning the live scope off and, and, and just kind of grinding a little plug around or, or flipping in some of that wood and, and, and just kind of the grassroots, you know, going back to river fishing. I do get over there, uh, but, but not as often as I should. I, I tell you, I have not. Um, Barkley is a, is a lake that, to me, I have a hard time, and I, I just haven't spent you know, a ton of time. Like I'll go over there for a day and then it might be three or four months before I ever go back or, or maybe another year or so. But um, it's a hard place to kind of stay on top of them. Like it seems like in Barkley more so than anywhere else I've ever been, they can all show up and they can all disappear. Like it's, it, I've never seen a lake where, and it could be from one day to the next where it seems like, man, this is so easy. And then you go the next day, and they're just not there. I mean, it's just it's not happening. Um, but I do enjoy that, uh, you know, that challenge. I, I like those river systems over there, like Barkley. And, and, you know, it kind of fishes a lot like Wheeler in, in some regards. I enjoy those because it's not as much of a pattern. It's more of like kind of got to get in an area and, you know, grind it out and catch what's living there. But Something else that, uh, that 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 brings up that that I want to mention that um, when uh, you know we were talking about practicing and, and learning and and you know how to to come across these fish when when you feel like and we've all had this like you're fishing along and you go man there's just I really don't know if there's a bass in this lake like if he is i'm not around him he's not gonna bite my cricket I, I don't know what's going on but it just everything feels so hard and everything's it, what when you get that feeling whatever it is that you're doing like pattern wise and bait wise stop right then as soon as you get that feeling of man this is this is just impossible like this is just not going to happen it will they're always biting some way somewhere you just got to figure it out. And if you keep doing exactly what you've been doing, that's not working. It, you're not learning anything. So it's that's like, it, it, I can't tell you how many times I, I've gone and we've all done this. Like you have that exact thought, like, man, I, joking around, like there's not a bass in this lake. You make one decision, one good move. And 15 minutes later, you're, you're KVD. Like you, you got 20, no problem it's you know you can catch them as fast as you want to as many as you want to and all that revolved around one decision um so it's i, I just i encourage everyone if you feel like you're stuck in that rut and you feel like man this is just it's not happening well then quit doing what you're doing and i know that seems sim like stupid simplistic but we we get so caught up in myself uh, probably more so than most people but i I get so caught up in what I think they're supposed to do that I'm not listening to them telling me that they're not doing that. Go do something else, you know, that sort of thing. So just keep that in mind. If it seems really hard on you, it, it is, but it doesn't have to be. You know what I mean? Let's just make some some changes. And, and um, even if they're wrong, I'd rather you make a decision and it be wrong than to just keep doing the wrong thing all day long and then expect something to change, you know, something to happen. That's gonna yeah. Unlock another piece of that puzzle, whether it's a positive right. or a negative. Or a it's negative, to you're going to learn from it. Doing the same thing that you're doing and, and it not working is, is my problem. That's where you're, you're, you're kind of stuck. You know, you're, you're not able to learn much from that other than they're not doing this. Well, one other thing I'll add on the back side of that before we wrap this up is, also, when you get that feeling, you're in that situation. <clears throat> something that I've been learning to do is pick up your trolling motor and go get just let let the breeze go through your hair for a couple minutes and, and clear your mind. Go to another area. You don't have to run all the way down the lake. Is that a ball you, joke? <laughs> no, you don't have to run all the way down the lake, but uh, but go look at another cove or go look at another section of the lake just to uh, just to clear your mind, man. That that's yeah, yeah. That and, works and, pretty and, good too. Something, something else, you know, along those lines, something else that I've started doing this year and 
you know, a long practice day. May not do this on a, you know, a shorter day, but uh, but on a long day, daylight to dark, or or say we're having one of those days where just nothing's going right and things just nothing feels good. Everything feels like harder than what it should be. Not going our direction. I've started to just sit down, and I'm so and Kate knows this. Like I'm so gung ho. Like I can't even fathom sitting down for five seconds. But I've when I get in that bad um, mental state of mind, like everything's kind of negative and you start second guessing, like if I'll just sit down and I'll make myself do it for at least like five or sometimes even 10 minutes, depends on how ill or <laughs> upset or how bad things are really going. But, but I'll sit down and just stop thinking about fishing, whatever it is. I'll just let my mind wander to whatever it wants to wander off to, but just stop thinking about fishing. And a lot of times, and sometimes I'll even sit down and like eat lunch, which I never sit down and do, but it's, it almost has a reset. Like a lot of times when I stand up, I feel totally different. I'm, it's almost like I'm starting a whole new day of fishing over. All I did was took five minutes and just sat down and, you mm -hmm. know, kind of took a breath and let the, like the intensity of, of what all's around me, you know, happening kind of go away and melt away and just let my mind at ease and go wherever it wants to go. A lot of times it relaxes you and calms you down. You're not rushing and you're not forcing things. When, when things aren't going your way, you tend to, you tend to force it. You want it to so bad that you try to make it happen. And, and that's one thing that's really helped me um, this year. I, I, I feel like, um, you know, especially on some of those long days when things aren't going right, it's, it's so easy to just put it on the trailer. But I'm that guy that's like, 30 minutes after I loaded up, I'm like, man, I still got 45 minutes. What am I doing? Like I, I could have, you know, that's three more pockets I could have looked in or whatever it is. But I found that I can almost kind of have that mental reset and, and uh, kind of get things kind of started over again. If I can just sit down and not think about it, take a little break and um, just kind of reset myself. Sometimes it's like, for me, I, I do that quite often where it's like you just showed up to the lake again. Right. Hey, that's maybe, what I'm saying. It's totally maybe instead of field. blasting out of that cove, maybe I idle out of that cove. Yep. And I just go around the corner and I and I and I reset, take a break off, whether it's a hot summer day or whether it's cold, you get out of the wind mm -hmm. a little bit, just relax a little bit, and maybe go fish down that bank and just fish for a little bit and reset. Yep. And yep. then go 90 to nothing again. It's just a it's every once in a while you need that hard reset. Absolutely. And, and, it, and doesn't, you know what? it doesn't take you don't need to take a, a, a state lunch. You don't need a 30 minute. No, 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 you know. no, no, no. You're right. Right. It's, it's a very quick, but, uh, but at the same time, I've also found that like 30 seconds or two minutes doesn't do anything. It doesn't allow your mind enough time to kind of come off that hill, yeah. so to speak, and, and yeah. relax enough to, to do what you need to do. And, and again, just like everything else that I've, that I've said, I, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to work for you, but it really has me, um, you know, in, in a, a lot more ways than really just fishing. I mean, I, I've really kind of started to do that. Um, I mean, you do that every day. You sit down and eat lunch, but like I'm so wide open. I, my mind's still going 9,000 miles an hour while I'm eating. You know, it's like I'm thinking about the next day or what I've got going on. And just to take that second to kind of refresh and, and uh, refill your mind with some positive energy, it really, it'll, it's helped me a ton. I know that. It's kind of giving you that, um, like you say, that fresh start all over again. Even though you may still be in a rut, you, you don't feel like it anymore. You know, that means so much. It's amazing how much the confidence and kind of the mental attitude plays into whether or not a fish bites, which amazes me. I don't, I, I can't explain that or understand it, but there's no way that it doesn't play a factor into it. Well, you were we were talking about yeah. that last week with, with Soka. About yep. the positivity transferring through the line, it almost seems like some days. Ah, yeah. Good energy. Right. It, it was like that this entire year for me. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I had my bad days, of course, like anybody. But um, it just seemed like every time a decision yeah. needed to be made, there was never any second guessing it. There was never any because things had been going right and good. And this is when things are easy. When things are going good and going right and every decision seems to be the right decision, you know, it's easy for that to happen. Again, where where this is difficult is when things aren't going good. And and that's when, you know, when it's a little harder to kind of uh, reshape things, get things back in, in order. But, um, but, yeah, you're exactly right. It's uh, no question. 
JB's is getting really nervous. So yeah, that, that getting that closer, getting closer. A little bit braver. It's getting used to our tone and everything. Uh, I got, I had the, a story. The, the positivity, of the, it, it feels it. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, feeling it. You're going to see it here a little bit. It's just going to pop its little head up on my shoulder and everybody's yeah. going to freak out. I, I you know, you're including down there, me. You're down there at Kentucky Lake. And I was down there several years ago. And this is the only place I ever had a mouse run across my chest when I was sleeping. Was that, down, remember when we stayed in that? That, that was the same place, I think. That shady, like four foot, the, 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 the little people built it. It had uh, really short. We're, we're over six foot. It was tough to walk around I, in there, but there was. I mean, you had a duck to walk in. Yeah, yeah. No, this I was, was laying. A, I was laying in. I was laying in bed, and I a, a mouse ran across my chest. Honest to goodness. Oh, oh. Yeah, it didn't bite me, but that's a that's well, a unique it, thing. I'm it got your crackers that night too. But I don't uh, know it got your crackers that night. No, that was that was another story about a mouse, but same same lake. Same. Uh, Two, we got two more quick questions, and then we'll yep. then we'll wrap this up. These are just last minute stuff coming in. Um, hit that one. Go up here just a little bit. Uh, uh, right those are, hold on, those are braided fluorocarbon. What do you? Uh, you you braid the fluorocarbon guy on your spinning tackle? I do. I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, FG knot. FG knot. Right. Okay. Right here. Brad says, what would you change first, um, lure location or lure. or lure type? Oh, that's so situational. Um, <laughs> yeah. Try to figure out how to answer that in the, in the, in the right way because really it's – there's not too – I almost want to say that you can put me in the same situation and I may, I may still make two different decisions there or say it two different ways, but I – Honestly, I um, here's the way I look at it, and here's here's why I feel like I'm more comfortable covering as much water or maybe more water than most people are. Um, is that my mindset, my mentality is I can catch some bass if I'm around them with the wrong bait, but I'm not going to catch any if I've got the right bait in the wrong location. Yeah, that makes so sense. So I, I definitely put, I guess I would say I put more emphasis on location, um, but there's no question that, that lure and technique plays a role. I mean, you can, you can fish right through them um, and, and, and never, you know, never know they were around. So, I mean, that, that plays, but, but again, I always bounce back. Like I do feel like that as long as you're around them, there's always a couple baits that you can catch some on. Now there's generally a technique that they'll bite better or trigger them, whatever it may be, but there's, you need to be around them before you can, you know, try to, to, to target them. Good answer. I like that. It makes total sense. And then um, somebody was asking about, do you, throw, do, you, do you ever throw big swim baits? Andy wants to know. I, I do. So I, I've started dabbling in the, in the glide bait um seen this year um had a lot of fun with it it was it was you know scoping with it and and without it's it's fun caught some really good ones didn't catch it i, I had not uh, caught a giant on it yet um it shows you a lot of fish show doesn't it it does that's what i was just fixing to say it is amazing how many a big glide will show you that i didn't even know were around on live scope you know mm -hmm. shoot off the bottom and um and and they'll do that only to the glide like you would never see that fish uh, you know at first i was always kind of turned off from the glide just because of how many followers versus uh you know committers and and that sort of thing but but the more that i throw it the more that i'm realizing that a lot of at least a percentage of those fish that that you got to come up on that glide we're never going to come up on anything but that to begin with, mm -hmm. some big giant bait like that. Now, you're not going to catch them all, but you weren't even going to get those fish to acknowledge much of anything else. So it, you're still further ahead. I mean, I can't tell you. Honestly, I have caught, and this is probably embarrassing, and all the glide guys will laugh at me, whatever, but I've caught more bass from throwing a glide, but not actually on a glide. So what I mean is, is like I'm throwing a glide and a big one, you know, or whatever it is, comes off the bottom and, and does her whole deal and gets all over it but never touches it. Typical glide stuff drives me nuts. 
But what oftentimes what she'll do is, is as long as she doesn't get, say, within 30 feet of the boat, uh, as long as you can get that glide away from her or whatever bait it is, away from her before she sees the boat, a lot of times they'll just turn and slowly kind of swim away from you. At that point, you can pick up something else. I know she's not going to bite this or she would have, you know, already. And so I've caught him on a jerk bait or uh, even caught some one day on a, a wacky rig uh, Cinco out in open water. Like, it's weird, but that's just what I could get them to, like, entice them, change their mood, get them uh, really fired up with that glide. But then I would have to throw something little in there to actually catch them. So. What I noticed on that big glide was like you go to spots that you've caught them before, you know that they're there. There's, there's been a school there all week, but maybe it was Saturday there was a tournament and you're there Sunday, just fun fishing. And all of a sudden they're gone. Like, yeah, where did these fish go? And you throw that big glide over and there's nothing, there is nothing on live scope as far as you can see. Yeah. And you go that, you twitch that big glide bait over, you know, it's maybe it's 14 foot of water and you're, it's down at six or eight foot, just, doing its thing and all of a sudden like here they come yep. here they start yep. six or eight of them just come off the bottom they may not be giants but now you you've got confidence back know what's around yeah exactly. Like, exactly and i've even I, i've even excuse me i remember one um i think i got a mouse in my, here too hmm. hey it's the time of year we got one that's like I don't know what clicking that and making all kinds of mouth noises over here. That may have been Squatch himself. I don't know what <laughs> something big enough to knock something over in there in the cabinet. Oh, but anyway, might be a dog man. <laughs> we got all kind of animals, but uh, uh, <laughs> man, that got me so tore up. I forgot what I was even saying. He was talking about throwing a big glide bait over the oh, bottom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, one of the biggest ones that I've caught again because of a glide, maybe not on a glide, but I actually caught it on a drop shot. Thanks. So just like you're talking about in like 14, 15 feet of water and followed it all the way up, turn around, and I watched her go all the way back to the bottom and just sat there. And I said, well, I see what's going to happen. I pitched the drop shot to her, and I mean raced over there. Like totally different, you know, mood from that glide. But again, had I not thrown the glide, I wouldn't have even known she was there. You know, it, so it's, it's, it's interesting. I am throwing big baits. But at the same time, like with the way, you know, tournament fishing and, and uh, you know, having someone with me kind of staring uh, over my shoulder, you know, most days, like it's it's hard to pick a big bait up, you know, a seven, eight, maybe not a seven, but an eight, nine, 10 inch glide or, or even just a, you know, a, like a, uh, a Huddleston or something and, and go sling it around. It's just not advantageous for for kind of what I do and, and, and how I like to fish, but I, I do like it. And, and I'm, I'm learning more and more about the glides. Um, there is a time and a place. I've just kind of got to figure those little windows out and where and when that sort of thing. Well, and for, to your point, like to have the wherewithal to pick up that drop shot, to pick up that wacky rig, to pick up that, that whatever Demiki style bait and throw it out there at it, not to reel that glide back in and try her again. Like you said, that yep. first time that bass sees that bait is the most important. Well, he just he or she just saw that nine inch glide bait. Now it's all hit it the first time, ain't gonna hit it the second time. Yeah, now it's all right, exactly, especially yeah, it, not it, something that big, yeah, you know, right. well, bait it, wise. Well, you're not reeling it past its head, it's not a reaction bite, it's right. it's the reaction of it hitting and what the heck is that coming exactly. up off the bottom, and then the rest of it, it's staring at it, going, Nope, that ain't a meal. Yeah, and I think so much of, of that attention that we – well, I know it is. So much of that attention that we see with a glide, it's just curiosity. Like, so much of that's not – and and I can tell just by how they're coming at the bait on, on, on scope. You know, like I alluded to earlier, a lot of times I would tell, you know, Gabe, like, oh, this one's going to bite. You, you could tell just the way she's taking off and, and coming at it, whereas the other ones would just kind of mope up there and almost just kind of – Hey, what's that? You know, uh, check it out, kind of thing. And uh, I think with those glides, it's just big enough. It's got a um, an enticing action, something that's it's natural, but yet it's not. Like I've never seen a crippled gizzard shad do that crazy s, you know, wave or or, or s glide. But it sure does, uh, you know, get them curious and and excited, even in a manner maybe not so much like I'm going to eat it, but it's just like, holy cow, what is that? I've, I've never seen it before, you know. 
Um, so it's it's interesting, and it's it's again, it's a fun aspect of it to learn. It's something that's fairly new to me to some degree, and and um, so I I have had a lot of fun with it this year, and and I guarantee you there will be a time and a place in a tournament or you know some situation that that I'll get a chance to throw something like that, but I, I just hadn't come across it yet. We got we got several people in here saying the rain and the cold is bringing the mice indoors. Well, I'm thinking by this weekend we might need to buy a cat or something because <laughs> it's going to be bad. Cold. It? We already got this many mice showing up. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna sit. In the, we'll, we're not gonna be on the lake, so I might just sit in the corner with the uh, old pellet gun and just start picking them <laughs> That's off. Right. That's right. Yeah, that'd be fun. Well, I'll, I'll have a post later this weekend and show you my haul. You know, everybody, <laughs> everybody cho- chose your there. picture of the big old deer they're holding or the strap of ducks. Got they got. Mice I'm going to have, have my mice laid out in the garage floor. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, let's wrap this up, man. It's It's been it's been fun, Jake. We covered a lot of territory. Um, Any closing thoughts or shout outs before we shut her down? Yeah, man. I, hey, I really appreciate it. I had a great time uh, with y'all. And, 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 Let's let's get together this spring and 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 go one day, man. I uh, we shoot, we can go three of us, and um, you know, there's again, there's so much that we can all take away from each other, and and you know, uh, I, I, that particular day, I I, I stayed so focused and kind of I knew what I had to do, and so I wasn't um, as in tune with what you were doing as as I normally would, but. Very, very rarely, even if it's someone that that might have only fished a couple times ever, like it's pretty rare that I can go fishing with someone and not learn something. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if it was like, hey, I don't want to do that. That didn't work. But it's I, I'm going to learn something, take something away from it. So I'd love for the three of us to get together and and, um, and see if we can catch us a couple. Yeah, we, like we can do that. Do. And and uh, love to have you back maybe – Four or five Absolutely. months or so when you're down in, in, in the middle of the season, and we'll get you back on here. And Absolutely. Uh, we'll see how things are going. Yeah. So, everybody, um, we do this every Tuesday night. Uh, next week, I'm supposed to have Johnny Schultz on here. Um, been been kind of emailing him back and forth and just trying to finalize it. But if that doesn't work out, We'll uh, we need to get Uncle Ron back on here. Um, we'll have somebody on here. So, appreciate seeing a lot of new faces in here tonight. And we like I said, we do this every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Love to see you back. Um, good luck out on the water. If you're going to go fishing, you need to go within the next three days. Cause yeah. we're going we're to have cabin fever here in a couple weeks. I do believe cause it's, it's yeah. coming. I'm going to get a lot of tackle ready in the next couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, this is the, this is probably the best thing that could have ever happened for me. Cause it's going to lock me in that tackle room and I'm super well, you... anxious, excited for the season. And man, I'm able to have everything labeled and I know exactly <laughs> where it all is for the first time. Like that's only going to last three days and it'll be yeah. all trash back up. But, but I'm going to have fun rigging it and getting it all ready. Heck yeah. Uh, Jake's social media is Jake Lawrence yeah. fishing on Facebook. Jake Lawrence right? fishing. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. then you got an Instagram page too, right? Yep. Yeah, I do. I, man, I'm getting all that going. I, I'm terrible about that stuff. I stay so wide open, so busy, but I'm I'm really going to work hard this year to, you know, really get aggressive on that and going to get a YouTube started, uh, you, you know, a, a channel started and um, kind of let everybody follow along through the year. And, and um, you know, again, as this is going to be a learning process for me, I, shoot, I'm going to be probably uh, bugging y'all two to death with, yep. with the knowledge that I, I was know, just that getting ready have over it, but yep. Um, you know, I'm going to be learning through this and, and, and I have some ideas and, and some creative things that, you know, I feel like would, would interest some people, but I'm also very open-minded and would love to know what everybody would like to see. You know, it's, um, it, it's hard to be, I want, I don't want to say original, but it's hard to be somewhat different. You know, it, it, when you're talking about the YouTube world and, and, and fishing, um, so, you know, I've got some things there, but, but again, I would love uh, to hear everybody else's opinions and uh, comments on what they think they'd like to see. So, yeah, it'd so be fun either way. We're going to have a good time. Send your suggestions over to Jake on the uh, social media and give him some ideas. Because you're right, it is hard to come up with some Yeah, I mean, it's just ideas. like I, I have so much knowledge about various things but it's like you get on youtube and you type that in and there's already a hundred videos yeah. it's like how can i make mine you know different it's not that i want to make it any better than yours or but it's just like how can i teach this 
or give this information to you in a different way. You know what I mean? And and so yeah. I have some some again some ideas, but I'm I'm open and and um, encourage anyone to 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 shoot me their ideas if they've got some. All right, good Sounds stuff, good. man. All right, thanks everybody, and uh, hope to see everybody next weekend or next week.